not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Hello and welcome to GB News Live with me, Mark Longhurst. And coming up for you today, it's Prime Minister's Questions, live from the House of Commons, with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak uh, to face Labour leader Sakir Starmer once more. Second se uh, session of this uh, new year. And the latest strike, of course, by nurses today over pay and patient safety, the backdrop. The Prime Minister could also face questions on the economy with inflation. Latest figures today still at a 40-year high, even though it's uh, dropped a little. Also likely to face questions over that Scottish gender bill, which the government blocked last night and saw, uh, well, pretty vocal scenes in the chamber. So it all promises to be an exciting PMQs, which we'll be bringing to you live in just under 10 minutes. Well, today we'll be joined in the studio for PMQs by the Labour MP for Canterbury, Rosie Duffield, who'll be with us shortly, but already with us, Conservative MP for Blackpool South, Scott Benton. Scott, welcome to you. Thanks for being with us. Um, I, I guess at the moment the government's not too worried about the opposition, it's worried about the unions. That's what's really uh, taking them to task. Um, we've got the RCN saying, look, we've got to sort this, we've got to get around the negotiating table and an indication that Steve Barclay had tried to say that to the Prime Minister and the Treasury? According to media speculation, I'm, I'm led to believe that's the case. Clearly, most important issues facing the government are the economy and inflation. The trade union strikes are a consequence of inflation. My concern is we can't end up in a situation where we go back to the 1970s, where we have rampant inflation. The government gives in to different trade unions with 10, 15, 20% pay, pay rises, which then have to be funded by taxation. And before you know it, working families yeah. aren't any better off. But what, so what, that's what, why the government has to hold the line. Yeah, what do you say, though, to those economists who say, well, actually, the, 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 the thing that really... Uh, fuels inflation are private sector pay deals, not the public sector. So they're looking at the wrong set of statistics, if you like. Well, I think it's both. It would be wage creation and wage growth across the economy as a whole. But let's not forget the cost on the exchequer of providing the additional wage rises. We're talking about billions of pounds. There was a figure provided in the House of Commons earlier this week, £1,000 extra mm. for every single family if we have large public sector wages. Because it's not just it's the percentages, it's actually the cash terms Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, yeah. that's yeah. the problem we have. So yeah. the government has to hold the line. Public sector workers do a brilliant job, but we have to be reasonable and proportionate as a country in what we can afford. Right, we'll come back to that in a moment. I'm glad to say Rosie is here. Um, perhaps for a nice quiet rest in the television <laughs> studio after events yeah, in the chamber hopefully. yesterday. Just to recap, it was quite a raucous session over mm. this Scottish bill on, on gender yeah. rights. Mm -hmm. um, are you feeling a bit bruised by it all? Um, I mean, the chamber can get really rowdy, as Scott will testify as well, but um, it was particularly rowdy yesterday. Mm. Uh, I mean, just, just to point out, I think there was uh, one... <laughs> Point, a comment from your own side, from your own party, Ben Bradshaw, former Labour minister, yeah. absolute rubbish. Yeah. Um, and I think your comment was um, that how very progressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of a lot of those men, uh, you know, have fought for 
decades, you know, like I have, for gay rights and equality. Mm. And it's just really disappointing that when a woman speaks up about women's rights specifically, they can get shouted down by those same people that they've worked alongside. And, and just to explain to people, um, you were uh, looking at the issue that the government's identified in this, in, in terms of putting this Section yeah. 35 in order, mm -hmm. uh, and that is... Um, the, the issue of, of things like single-sex spaces, yeah. changing rooms, yes. for instance, yeah. uh, or, or even uh, in terms of um, sort of health visitors mm -hmm. and, and, and so on and so forth. And you think that this could cause problems yes. for women because yeah. of the, the issue of self-identification of gender. Yes, because the bill doesn't actually mention the word trans. It's, right. it's designed to help people who've lived as, as trans people, but because it is such a wide net, anybody can self-identify under that particular bill and that could cause problems for women needing single-sex spaces. Yeah, and, and this is why, uh, or part of the reason why Alistair Jack has obviously instituted um, this block. Yeah. Um, because, obviously, it, it touches on the 2010 Equality mm -hmm. Act, but also that this indication that he's had from, I think, quite senior legal sources, yes. he was saying, yeah. um, that this could actually cause quite... I think a serious adverse impact was the first. Yeah, that he I mean, I think that's the problem. This clash of rights, and we've all, all parties, have sort of slightly pushed it down the road, kicked the can down the road. We haven't had to deal with this particular issue yet. Mm. I think we were hoping that we would sort of thrash it out, but we have to thrash it out how it affects people. And the gender rights issue, the, that side of this bill, is devolved. The Equality Act isn't. It's nationwide. Right. That was the clash, and that's what the government had to sort out. Okay, um, and from from the Tory point. Of of you clearly it was the SNP they were trying to fight off yesterday on this particular inst instance and, and I know Labour have called this a constitutional bun fight but it is still that issue about uh, addressing the, the, the trans trans rights w where do you stand on this issue of protecting women particularly in single-sex spaces and so on I can just start off by saying how brave Rosie was in the House of Commons yesterday there were a number of SNP and Labour MPs who were speaking absolute nonsense and Rosie was one of the few who I suspect 80% of the general population would have agreed with what you have said. So what we have here is a complex it's cross legal consensus. It <laughs> is. One hundred percent. It does happen. It does happen. Yeah. And Rosie was fantastic yeah. yesterday. Thank you. This is complex legal, right. cultural, and constitutional issue. I think the yeah. Secretary of State was entirely correct yesterday. It was a reasonable and proportionate measure mm. to invoke Section 35. My main concern here is about protecting vulnerable women mm. and children right. from potential abuse use via this legislation. Okay. What we could see is a Scottish biologically male prisoner in an English jail reassigning their gender and ending up in a women's prison. Yeah. That is one of, just one of the possibilities... The consequences... ...absolutely of, yeah. of this uh, legislation. Although, obviously, indication Nicola Sturgeon wants a legal review, judicial review on this, so it may well have to go through the court. However, let's address the issue of the day in terms of PMQs. Um, I, was, I was putting the point um, to Scott that actually the government doesn't have to worry perhaps about the opposition so much at the moment. Matter it's the unions, the given, yes. of course, the fact that the yeah. RCN yeah. has got Very the, the action I mean, it's today. the big issue, isn't it? and it's bound to be what Labour goes on today. I think most questions, or lots of the questions, will, will sort of reflect that. And, and Labour is in a difficult position because Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, has admitted you can't put a figure on what you would actually perhaps offer to all these public sector unions, particularly the transport unions. Yeah, I think it'd be unusual for Labour to reveal that before a general election the manifesto anyway, to be fair, but we're not at the negotiating table. What we're saying as a party is get round the table, let's talk about these things. And some of the unions have said that they are willing to talk. Mm. I think Pat Cullen from the RCN has said out loud, you know, I don't necessarily want to go for the 19%, which was the figure that was muted. We'll settle somewhere, but they need to sit down and talk. Yeah, was, was that a bit cack-handed going in on, on that figure? Um, I think... Immediately on the back foot as a result Yeah, of I mean, I think figures like that banded around do put the public off. I'm not sure unions were asking for that. It was just that they wanted to start negotiations and that is where inflation's been. Yeah. The suggestion that we were reading, again, media speculation, uh, is that perhaps uh, a one-year deal, a one-off, tied into next year's pay award could actually solve this, in that it wouldn't tie in a percentage rise for year after year with all the sort of national insurance increases and so on. I mean, surely that's a quite common-sense way out of the 
the difficulty, isn't it? Potentially. As a backbench MP, I'm not close to the negotiations, but I do know the Health Secretary is doing everything he can to resolve this. Clearly, the winter pressures on the NHS have been exacerbated by COVID this year. We have nurses striking, we have the ambulance strike. Yeah, and for well. 47,000 unfilled nursing posts. I mean, that surely is an indication of the government it's not working. Well, we've put record amounts of money into the NHS, billions of pounds extra. We have a record number of nurses and doctors. But I think what we both need, uh, I think both parties would agree, the NHS needs fundamental reform. And whoever wins the next general election has to grapple with a rise in budget, right. but rising demands on the service yeah. as well, yeah. and how we address and, and is that, systemic issues. is that something that the unions would have to accept, that they I may have so. to have, change yeah. working practices yet again? I to... think, look, we can all see the NHS is on its knees, and it can't just be for kind of just because of covid or just because we don't have enough nurses i mean Keir was talking about middle management shake up i think Wes was as well i don't i'm not an expert in those things and how the nhs works but i think we need to look at the whole thing in the round and talk to consultants talk to people on the ground talk to nurses talk to healthcare workers what do they want to see because their morale is rock bottom mm, and i think I, i'm right in saying ambulance workers from both unite and gmb likely to perhaps decide on, on more uh, strike action a, like a I mean, they later. didn't join the force to sit for 15 hours outside a hospital. I read mm. a case last week of a woman who bled to death in an ambulance. That's not what they, what they signed up for. So the trauma that they're suffering when they really want to save lives is pretty awful. Do you think the government gets it? I hope they're beginning to, yeah. I mean, we'll see if they start negotiating. And, and I understand Scott's line, you know, the government have got to hold the line. That, that's a very sort of government line, mm. but there's got to be some negotiation. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people are indicating, uh, particularly from the unions, that the uh, public sector uh, issue in terms of the independent pay review bodies, they're not necessarily that independent. I don't think that's the case. I mean, that's the current process. They, they, it is an arm's length system from it's ministers. what you've got at the moment to do and, with and, and rightly so. And the vast majority of those recommendations are accepted, in this case included. The police award last year was accepted too. Right. Speaker on his feet. I think we can just uh, go over to uh, the chamber now for the start of Prime Minister's questions. Speaker. Mr Speaker, I know members from across the House will be as shocked and appalled as I am about the case of David Carrick. The abuse of power is truly sickening and our thoughts are with his victims. The police must address the failings in this case, restore public confidence and ensure the safety of women and girls. There will be no place to hide for those who use their position to intimidate those women and girls or those who have failed to act to reprimand and remove those people unfit from office. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Kate yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the project champion for the North Midlands Manufacturing Corridor, next week I'm bringing together businesses, leaders and local councillors from across the region in Parliament to set out to Department for Transport officials the importance of the A50, A500 corridor. The Prime Minister understands the importance of investing in our infrastructure and unlocking the potential of our towns and cities. So will he urge government colleagues from Bays and DLUC to attend the meeting and to hear more about the benefits this investment would bring to our region. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Government recognises the strategic importance of the A50, A500 corridor to the Midlands. I know final decisions on this scheme will be made in the third road investment strategy, which is fully published next year, but I know my honourable friend will be contacting ministers in the relevant departments to invite them to hear her case. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his comments about the dreadful case of Carrick? Mr Speaker, it's three minutes past twelve. If somebody phones, if somebody phones 999 now because they have chest pains and fear it might be a heart attack, when would the Prime Minister expect an ambulance to arrive? Yeah. Oh. Mr Speaker, it's absolutely right that people can rely on the emergency services when they need them. And that's why we're, 
rapidly implementing measures to improve the delivery of ambulance times and indeed urgent and emergency care. But I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he cares about ensuring that patients get access to life-saving emergency care when they need it, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister could deflect all he likes, but for the person for the person suffering from chest pains, the clock started ticking straight away. Every minute counts. That's why the government says an ambulance should be there in 18 minutes. In that case, it would mean just about 20 past 12. Now, I, don't, I know he doesn't want to answer the question I asked him, so I'm going to ask him again. When will that ambulance arrive? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, because of the extra funding we're putting in to relieve pressure in urgent and emergency care departments, because of the investment we're putting in in ambulance call handling, we will improve ambulance times as we are recovering from the pandemic and indeed the pressures of this winter. But I say to the honourable gentleman again, because he makes my case for me, he describes the life-saving care that people desperately need. So why? When in other countries like France, Spain, Italy and others, why is he depriving people here that care? Mr Speaker, he obviously doesn't know or doesn't care. I'll tell him. If our heart attack victim had called for an ambulance in Peterborough at 12.03, it wouldn't arrive until 10 past two. These are our constituents waiting for ambulances I'm talking about. If it was Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 20 past two. Order, order, order. Mr Blister, I hope you want to see the rest of the questions out, because I want you to be here, but you're going to have to behave better. Come on, get started. Mr Speaker, I'm talking about our constituents. If they were in Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 20 past two. If they were in Plymouth, it wouldn't arrive until 20 to three. That's why someone who fears a heart attack waiting more than two and a half hours for an ambulance. Not the worst case scenario, just the average wait. So for one week, will he stop blaming others, take some responsibility and just admit under his watch, the NHS is in crisis, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I noticed the one place the honourable gentleman didn't mention was Wales, yeah. where we know ambulance times are even worse than they are in England, Mr Speaker. No, and the reason, the reason that is the case, because this is not about politics. This is about the fact that the NHS in Scotland, in Wales, in England is dealing with unprecedented challenges, recovering from COVID, dealing with a very virulent and early flu season, and everyone is doing their best to bring those wait times down. But again, I'll ask him, if he believes so much in improving ambulance wait times, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Mr Speaker, he won't answer any questions and he won't take any responsibility. By one o'clock, our heart attack victim is in a bad way. Sweaty, dizzy, chest tightening. This is a heart attack and they're shouting, this is your constituent. By that time, they should be getting treatment. But an hour after they've called 999, they're still lying there, waiting, listening to the clock tick. How does he think they feel knowing an ambulance could be still hours away. Well, Mr Speaker, the specific and practical things we are doing to improve ambulance times are clear. We are investing more in urgent and emergency care to create more bed capacity. We are ensuring that the flow of patients through emergency care is faster than it ever has been. We are discharging people at a record rate out of hospitals to ease the constraints that they are facing. And we are reducing the call-out rates by moving people out of ambulance stacks and being dealt with in a community. Now, these are all very practical steps that will make a difference in the short term. But I ask him again and again, and we know why. The reason that he is not putting patients first when it comes to ambulance waiting times is because he is simply in the pockets of his union paymaster. Mr Speaker, this isn't hypothetical. This is real life. 
Stephanie from, Ply- <laughs> Stephanie from Plymouth was battling cancer when she collapsed at home. Her mum rang 999, desperate for help. She only lived a couple of miles from the hospital, but they couldn't prioritise her. She was 26 when she died waiting for that ambulance. A young woman whose life was ended far too soon. And as a dad, I can't even fathom that pain. So, on behalf of Stephanie and her family, will you stop the excuses, stop shifting the blame, stop the political games, and simply tell us when will he sort out these delays and get back to the 18-minute wait? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, of course. Stephanie's case is a tragedy. Of course, people are working as hard as they can to ensure people get the care they need. But he talks about political games. He is a living living example of playing political games when it comes to people's health care. I've already mentioned what's been going on in Wales. Is he confident in the Labour-run Wales NHS that nobody is suffering right now? Of course they are, Mr Speaker, because the NHS everywhere is under pressure. What we should be doing is supporting those doctors and nurses to make the changes that we are doing to bring the care to those people. But I'll ask him this. If he is so, so concerned, so concerned about making sure that the Stephanies of the future get the cares they need, why? Why is he denying those families the guarantee of emergency life-saving care? So that's his answer to Stephanie's family. Deflect, blame others, never take responsibility. Just like last week, he won't say when he's going to deliver the basic minimum service levels people need. Mr Speaker, over the 40 minutes or so that these sessions tend to last, 700 people will call an ambulance. Two will be reporting a heart attack. Four will be reporting a stroke. But instead of the rapid help they need, many will wait and wait and wait. So if he won't answer any questions, will he at least apologise for the lethal chaos under his watch? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he he asks about the minimum safety levels. We, We will deliver them as soon as we can pass them. Why won't he vote for them, first of all? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are we are delivering on the people's priorities. As we've seen this week, the honourable gentleman will just say anything if the politics suits him. It's as simple as that. He will break promises left, right, and centre. He promised to nationalise public services. He promised to have a second referendum. He promised to defend the mass migration of the EU. And now we're apparently led to believe that. He- oh, oh, I expect the front bench just to keep a little quiet, because if they don't, there's somewhere else for them to shout their noise. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if we are going to deliver for the British people, people need to have strong convictions. But when it comes to the honourable gentleman, he isn't just for the free movement of people, he's also got the free movement of principles. Mr Speaker, on Monday the independent Net Zero review was published by my honourable friend, the member for Kingswood. Does my right honourable friend join me in welcoming many of those recommendations and in particular to provide clarity and continuity to all those working to decarbonise our economy, especially those uh, supporting South Shropshire Climate Action Group in my constituency? Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend, the member for Kingswood, for his review, but also pay tribute to my right honourable friend for his work in this area. Uh, I'm pleased that the report recognised the UK's leadership in tackling climate change and catalysing a global transformation in how other countries are dealing with it. Uh, we have, as the report acknowledged, exceeded expectations to decarbonise, and we're responding to the full range of uh, the review's requests and recommendations in the coming year. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Mr Speaker, to promise is a thing, to keep it is another. Well, the Scottish Government kept their manifesto promise to the people, and thanks to support from members of all political parties in Holyrood, the GRR Bill was passed. 
Surely in that context, the Prime Minister must recognise that it is a dangerous moment for devolution when both he and indeed the Leader of the Opposition seek to overturn a promise made between Scotland's politicians and Scotland's people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear that the decision in this case is centred on the legislation's consequences for reserved matters, as is laid out in the Scotland Act, which established the Scottish Parliament, which the Honourable Gentleman talks about, and at the time supported by the SNP, this bill would have a significant adverse effect on UK-wide equalities matters, and so the Scottish Secretary, with regret, has rightly acted. No Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear. This is the Conservative Party seeking to stoke a culture war against some of the most marginalised people in society. And Scotland's democracy is simply collateral damage. And on that issue of democracy, let's reflect. Because on Monday, the UK government introduced legislation to ban the right to strike against the express wishes of the Scottish government. On Tuesday, they introduced legislation to overturn the GRR against the express wishes of the Scottish government. And this evening, they will seek to put in place legislation that rips up thousands of EU protections against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. Are we not now on a slippery slope from devolution to direct rule? No, 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 Mr. S no, Mr Speaker, of course we're not. This is simply about protecting UK-wide legislation, about ensuring the safety of women and children. This is not about the devolution settlement. I would urge the Honourable Gentleman and his party to consider engaging with the UK Government on this bill, as we did before the legislation passed, so that we can find a constructive way forward in the interests of the people of Scotland and the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The care, education and support that children receive in their earliest years has the biggest impact on their future life outcomes. And that's why the affordability, accessibility and quality of childcare is so important for families in Eddersbury and right across the country. Yet, despite significant investment by the UK Government since 2010, for too many families the childcare system remains inflexible, complex and expensive. So, can I ask my right honourable friend to restate to this House his commitment to address this essential and pressing issue so that every child can have the best start in life? Yeah. Well, I know this is a, a topic my honourable friend knows very well from his uh, own background, and he's right that it is essential to access quality childcare, which is why we provide every three and four year old eligible with at least 15 hours a week of free childcare. And we are considering new plans to improve the cost, choice, and affordability of childcare, whether consulting on ratios or indeed supporting more people to become childminders. A transport secretary implying NHS workers are deliberately putting people in danger. A health secretary pitting dedicated nurses against vulnerable patients. Does the Prime Minister really expect the public to believe that the very people who have dedicated their lives to saving life and limb are so reckless? Or is it not the case that this government have pushed them to their absolute limit and they have no other option but to strike? Uh, Mr Speaker, we have enormous respect and gratitude for all our public sector workers, especially those uh, in the NHS, which is why we have backed them with not just record funding, but also record investment in more doctors and nurses, 15,000 more doctors, 30,000 more nurses and more life-saving equipment, which will help them do their jobs, and we continue to want to engage constructively in dialogue with them. David Simmons. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Ryslip Northern and Pitta has a great many car-dependent, uh, older and disabled constituents, many of whom are horrified to read that the Mayor of London may have manipulated the outcome of his own consultation may have manipulated the outcome of his own consultation in order to impose an unwanted £12.50 daily charge every time they go to a medical appointment or attend hospital. So does my right honourable friend agree with me? that any further rollout of the ULES should be paused until these matters have been fully investigated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, 
Well, my, uh, my honourable friend has rightly pointed out that transport in London is devolved to the Labour Mayor of London, and it is disappointing that the Mayor, backed by the Leader of the Opposition, is choosing not to, listening, not to listen to the public, expanding the zone against the overwhelming views of residents and businesses. I urge the Mayor to properly reconsider and respond to these serious concerns. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister showed his card this week by ramming through the sacking nurses bill. He has, he has, he has literally gone from clapping nurses to sacking them. His Transport Secretary has said that the bill is unworkable and the Education Secretary has said that it is not, it is not needed. Why does he still want the bill? Mr Speaker, it was the Labour Party that showed their cards this week when it came to backing working people. What I'd say, what, what I'd say, what I'd say to the honourable gentleman, what I'd say, what I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he really cares about supporting patients, if he really cares about children getting the education they receive, if he really cares about working people being able to go about their lives free from disruption, he should join actually in legislation which is prevalent in many other countries, ensure minimum safety levels in our critical public services and get off the picket lines himself. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Continuing a theme, uh, evidence is now very clear that the London Mayor's sham consultation here, here. has suppressed yep. 5,000 negative responses from members and supporters of Fair Fuel UK, of which I am the APPG chairman. Now, what angers me is this is a tax against my residents in South Thanet. It's a tax against Kent residents. It's a tax against all of the home counties. This is true taxation without representation yeah, yeah. and I, I when my right honourable friend assure me he will do all that he can to stop this because it is a tax that is a fill up against a failed mayor's budget yeah. and a failed mayor. Well, my, my honourable friend makes an excellent and powerful point. The Labour mayor is imposing this tax on a public which does not want it. He's right to highlight that. Expanding this zone is not something that communities want, and I look forward to working with him to urge the mayor to properly consider and respond to all these views and stop this unfair tax. When David, Mr. Speaker, during a period of 12 months. Two of my Cafinicated ones have lost their lives after being attacked by dangerous dogs. A ten-year-old boy and a senior citizen. Fatalities have also occurred in other parts of the country. It is clear that the Dangerous Dogs Act is woefully inadequate. The Government has commissioned studies. It has debated the subject at length, but it has done nothing. My question is, when will the Government take action on the issue of dangerous dogs. Yeah. 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 Well, my, uh, my honor, the honourable gentleman raises uh, a very important case, and I'm very sorry to hear about the specific families that he mentions. And we recognise that dog attacks can have horrific consequences. And I want to assure him that we take the issue incredibly seriously. And that's why we've established a working group between police, local authorities, and other key stakeholders to consider all aspects of tackling irresponsible later this year. And of course, the government will respond promptly. Karen Bradley. Speaker. Mr Speaker, Staffordshire uh, Moorlands District Council, run by the Conservatives, has an excellent track record of delivering for my constituents whilst keeping council tax low. We have put a bid in to the levelling up fund, and I know that that money would make such an incredible difference to my constituents. So will he use his good office to encourage the Department for Levelling Up to look favourably on us this week? Well, um, I, my, uh, my right honourable friend has been a stalwart champion for her community, and in particular their levelling up fund bid, which I know will make a massive difference to her community. I wish her and her constituents every success when we announce the next successful round of bidders to that fund. Sarah Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my constituents in Chesham and Amersham are struggling to keep up with their energy bills this winter. When they do fall behind, too often families are punished by being switched over to prepayment meters, which are more expensive, which does nothing to help the financial situation. Will the Prime Minister back our call to ban energy companies from forcibly installing prepayment meters and stop energy companies from switching smart meters over to prepayment meters remotely? Well, 
Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the Honourable Lady that Ofgem actually has specific regulations in place regarding the use of prepayment meters and how energy companies should treat those that are struggling with their bills. But what I am pleased to say is that her constituents will receive around £900 at a minimum of support with their energy bills this winter as a result of the actions of this government. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute and thanks to the several thousand people at MOD Defence Equipment and Support at Abbey Wood in my constituency who worked tirelessly to ensure that the military equipment and supplies that we have pledged to the people of Ukraine are dispatched quickly and efficiently? And does he agree with me that events in Ukraine are a reminder yet again of the need to invest more in our own sovereign defence manufacturing capability? Well, Mr Speaker, Honourable Friend makes an excellent point, and I'm happy to join him in paying tribute to his constituents at the MOD facility. The work they are doing is making a critical difference in the fight to combat Russian aggression in Ukraine. I know it's extremely appreciated both by the President of Ukraine and his people, and he's right also that it highlights the need for more investment, which is why we're putting £24 billion of investment into our armed forces, but also increasing the amount of kit that we manufacture here at home. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's almost a, a year to the day since the then Business Secretary, at uh, a visit to the British Rural site in my constituency, promised the company £100 million and proudly boasted to the national media that he couldn't think of a, a better project that better demonstrated levelling up. Yesterday, the company and our administration haven't received not a penny in financial support from the government. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that there's not a single project in the country that better demonstrates the government's lack of industrial strategy, failure of levelling up, and abandonment of the North East? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, first of all, let me say my thoughts are with the company's employees and families at the time, and we stand ready to support those impacted. Now, let me just... Let me just outline for the Honourable Gentleman what exactly has happened. We did offer significant support to British Vault through the Automotive Transformation Fund, considerable amount of funding, but entirely reasonably, and it's not something that I expect the Labour Party to understand, that support was conditional on the company receiving private investment as well, which I think is a sensible protection for taxpayers. Unfortunately, that didn't materialise, but I think it's completely wrong completely wrong to take from that about the, what else is happening in the North East. Across the North East, there is new investment in the new Envision and Nissan plant, in electric vehicle manufacturing, a billion pound investment in the North East. Just look at what's happening in Teesside or on clean energy. This government is committed to the North East and it will deliver more jobs and opportunity under this Conservative administration. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has long been a friend to business. As Chancellor, he listened to businesses in Stoke-on-Trent Central about yeah, their yeah. issues. Stoke-on-Trent has a wide range of manufacturing, fabrication and engineering excellence. Does he agree with me that growing these activities is a vital strand of our levelling up ambitions? And may I invite him to revisit my constituency to meet with them? Yeah. Why, uh, my uh, my honourable friend is an excellent champion for her constituents and particularly her advanced manufacturing uh, businesses, which I've had the pleasure of visiting with her in the past. It's important that we support those businesses on energy prices, which we are doing through the announcement the Chancellor recently made, particularly with regard to generous support for energy intensive industries. And indeed, they can also apply for up to £315 million of capital grant funding to help them make the transition to net zero. Oh, Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, when I had breast cancer, I had phenomenal nurses. When I had to be rushed to the A&E, the ambulance crew looked after me. Unison GMB, they're on strike because no one's negotiating with them. Mr Speaker, for the first time in the Royal College of Nursing History, yes. they have balloted and they are on strike yes. today. I've spoken to the General Secretary of the RCN. She's adamant she wants to end the disputes. She just needs a meeting with the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister show leadership and meet with the RCN? Just a simple yes or no. Mr Speaker, at the turn of the year, the Government wrote to all unions, including the RCN, to invite them for 
frank, open, honest two-way dialogue with relevant secretaries of state. I'm pleased that those meetings are happening in a range of sectors, and I hope that we can find a constructive way through this. Um, because we approach Holocaust Memorial Day, colleagues can sign the early day motion, they can sign the book of commitment, they can attend the various commemorative services. I have to report some very sad news to the House, that the well-known Holocaust survivor, Ziggy Shipper, died at the age of 93 in the early hours of this morning. He, went out, he was a survivor of Auschwitz, Birkenau and Stotthaus, Stotthof concentration camps. He spent his life in this country spreading his message of hope to young people. Will my wonderful friend uh, join with me in thanking Ziggy for his life, for his message, which is very vitally important as we sit here today. Do not hate. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm very sorry to learn that Ziggy has passed away, and my thoughts are, of course, with uh, his family. Uh, I know he was a, a man with wonderful, wonderful energy and humanity, and I pay tribute to him for his work, and indeed all Holocaust survivors who have so bravely shared their testimonies. We must have never forget the Holocaust, and as my honourable friend rightly said, I know the whole House will join me and him in echoing Ziggy's message, which is poignant and accurate. Do not hate. Graham Stringer. Will the Prime Minister join his Conservative uh, predecessors in guaranteeing that the HS2 project uh, reaches Manchester, or does he still believe uh, that investment should be taken for poorer areas in the north than given to the more affluent parts of Kent. Mm. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this government is, is investing record sums in uh, transport infrastructure across the country, but especially in the north and Midlands, with the £96 billion integrated rail plan, which will improve journey times east-west across the north and connectivity across the east Midlands. It's a record we're proud of, and now we'll get on with delivering it. Richard Fuller. Speaker, there's been a 40% increase in patients on roll with GPs in Biggleswade in the last 15 years, but last week proposals for a Biggleswade Health Hub were not progressed, despite support, financial support from Conservative-controlled Central Bedfordshire Council. So can my right honourable friend advise me what is the status of our manifesto commitment to infrastructure first? And will he and his ministers work with me to bring together the various parts of the NHS to bring the Biggleswade, Biggleswade Health Hub back on track? Well, I'd be very happy to organise a meeting for the Honourable Gentleman to discuss how to progress his project. He's right about the importance of primary care. There is more investment going in, but we want to make sure it works for his constituency, and I look forward to arranging a meeting with him with the relevant Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is well aware of the injustice of prepayment metres, not briefly recently because he commented on it earlier in a question, because it's long-standing. Higher tariffs and higher social charges. Why then? Has he allowed a situation where hundreds of thousands have been forced into that penury at a time when winter is upon us and prices are rocketing and where we face a situation of 8.4 million people facing fuel poverty in April? All he requires to do is to instruct, through himself or through a minister, off gem to ensure that there is an equalisation of tariffs between debit and credit and also that his government takes steps to provide a fund for those who have seen debt arise because of his government's failures. Will he end that manifest injustice of the poor paying most? Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman's proposal would also increase bills for many millions of families, so I'm not sure it is the right approach. But what we are doing is providing around £900 of specific support with all families' energy bills this winter. There's further targeted support for those who are most vulnerable, which is absolutely the right thing to do. And, as the Chancellor has already announced, we're consulting on what the best thing to do going forward, including options, as he mentioned, such as a social tariff, as part of our wider reforms to the retail energy market. <laughs> Laura Farris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every single country in the G7 requires some level of minimum service to be provided when strikes take place in essential public services, often with laws that actually go much further than that. Does my right honourable friend agree that the British people should be entitled to the same basic level of protection when strikes take place in these services? And does he think the former Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair had a point when he said last year the big defect at the birth of the Labour Party was its tie to organised labour. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, 
Miss my, my honourable friend put it very well, but she's right to make the point that what we are proposing is in line with the vast majority of other countries around the world. Indeed, many countries ban strikes in blue light services altogether. We are not doing that. We are joining countries across continental Europe and having minimum safety uh, laws, which I think reasonably the public would expect to have a level of emergency life-saving care in the event of strikes. I think that's a common sense, reasonable position to take, and we all know why the party opposite can't bring themselves to support it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This month, the right honourable member for Stratford-upon-Avon was forced to pay millions to HMRC to settle a tax dispute. Was the Prime Minister aware of the investigation when he appointed him to his Cabinet and as Chairman of the Conservative Party? Will the Prime Minister demand accountability from his Cabinet members about their tax affairs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, m- m- Mr Speaker, my, uh, my honourable friend has already addressed this matter in full, and that's nothing more that I can add. I would like to begin by putting on record this House's heartbreak at the tragic death this morning of our friend Dennis, the Minister of Interior Affairs in Ukraine, and his deputy, and all those who were killed in that tragic accident. I am sure this part of the House is united in our feeling on that. Turning to more local affairs, as many have pointed out, the Government, I understand, is in the final furlongs of giving out its levelling up bids, and I must ask him to look kindly upon building the borough market of the Midlands and building a future Meditech hub in Rutland. So can he assure me that not just urban but also rural areas will be levelled up. Well, Mr Speaker, let me join with my honourable friend in, in paying tribute to the family of the Interior Minister in Ukraine. I know our thoughts uh, will be with him uh, at this difficult time. Uh, and Also, I can confirm to her that this Government believes levelling up should apply equally everywhere across our United Kingdom. Urban and rural communities up and down the country will get the benefit of having the investment that they deserve, making sure that we can spread opportunity and ensure everyone has pride in the place that they call home. Mr Speaker, David Cameron said the Scottish Parliament was one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world, yet the Prime Minister continues to block the Scottish Parliament's clear mandate to allow Scots to choose their own future, and on Monday he sent his MPs through the lobbies to deny Scottish workers the right to strike, despite overwhelming Scottish Parliament opposition, and on Tuesday he sent his Secretary of State for Scotland to block an act of the Scottish Parliament voted for by 70% of MSPs, including Tories. Does he still think that David Cameron's ridiculous assertion holds any water whatsoever. Well, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, there have been 347 acts passed by the Scottish Parliament, which is undeniably one of the most powerful devolved legislatures anywhere in the world. In this exceptional case, it is clear that the Act does have adverse consequences for UK-wide equalities legislation. So, in those very exceptional circumstances, the Scottish Secretary has regretfully taken the decision to block passage of the legislation. But, as I said previously, we want to engage in a dialogue with the Scottish Government to ensure that we can find a constructive way through. The, the British people rightly expect us to be able to control our borders, so I was very pleased that the Prime Minister made one of his five priorities the need to stop the boats in the Channel. Yeah. Yeah. Can he reassure me and my constituents in Newcastle under Lyme that not only will we bolster the patrols on the French beaches, but we will make sure that people who do make that dangerous journey and arrive are removed? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right that this is a priority for all our constituents. Uh, he's right to highlight the new deal that we have with France, which, is, which increases funded patrols on French beaches by 40 per cent. And as he said, we must go further to solve this problem once and for all. And that means introducing new legislation that makes it unequivocally clear that if you enter the UK illegally, you should not be able to stay here, but instead will be swiftly detained and removed. Imran Hussain. Fine. Uh, Mr Speaker, last night the BBC revealed the Foreign Office knew the extent of Narendra Modi's involvement in the Gujarat massacre that paved the way for the persecution of Muslims and other minorities we see in India today, with senior diplomats reporting that the massacre could not have taken place without a climate of impunity created by Modi and that he was, in the FCO's own words, directly responsible for this violence. Given that hundreds were brutally killed and that families across India and the world, including here in the UK, are still without justice, does the Prime Minister agree with his diplomats in the Foreign Office that Modi was directly responsible? And just what more does the Foreign Office know of his involvement 
in this grave act of ethnic cleansing. Well, Mr Speaker, the UK Government's position on this has been clear and long-standing and, and hasn't changed. Of course, we don't tolerate persecution where it appears anywhere, but I'm not sure I agree at all with the characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman has put forward. That completes Prime Minister's questions. I'll just let the Chamber clear. So that's uh, Prime Minister's questions with health uh, matters to the fore, but not the nurses' strike. Uh, it was ambulance waiting times uh, that Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, went on. Uh, I think I've jotted down we didn't get a question on the nurses' strike until 12.28 from a Labour backbencher. Uh, were joining us uh, in the studio to uh, run their slide rule over the performances. Labour MP for Canterbury, Rosie Duffield. Uh, who, of course, survived a pretty raucous session in the Commons yesterday, and Conservative MP uh, for Blackpool uh, South, uh, Scott uh, Benton, with us too. So let's uh, just assess, first of all, Keir Starmer's approach by not going on nurses, mm. but going on ambulance times. It was quite um, a sort of, um, shall we say, legalistic approach in setting out these yeah. times of Northampton, Peterborough, Plymouth and so on. Mm. Very perhaps uncomfortable for the Prime Minister? Yeah, I mean, I would think so. Just by using those direct examples, all of us, everyone in the House will have had examples of people waiting for ambulances and the whole system is completely broken. The Prime Minister was really defensive in response mm. and sort of fairly straight, straight away started to blame nurses and, and everyone else for going on strike. But these crises have been happening since way before anyone went on strike. They're going on strike because their morale, as well as their pay, is rock bottom. Yeah. Well, and, and you were actually commenting while the session was on about the paucity of questions from the Labour backbenchers. Yeah, there weren't on... that many today, were there? And I thought more people would go on the strikes, actually. I yeah. thought more people would go on the health service. But there weren't that many on our side. And it's like a lottery, like you know. Yeah, you know, We just indeed. obviously didn't get that lucky this week. So given that, do you think Rishi Sunak uh, perhaps escaped... Uh, on the issue of, of the, the health strikes? I mean, clearly, uh, Keir Starmer was trying to pin him on uh, responsibility for the state of the, the health service. Um, but, as ever, um, the Prime Minister coming back about Labour being in the pockets of the union paymasters. I think Rishi Sunak was on fire once again, second week in a row. Keir Starmer couldn't lay a glove on him. And um, Rishi has this fantastic ability to think on his feet. He can move away from a preordained script in, in a capacity which previous Conservative Prime Ministers haven't been able to, whereas Keir Starmer sticks with this rigid approach. And in a fluid discussion such as that, I think it's pretty evident over the last few months that uh, Rishi Sunak is routinely beating Keir Starmer at PMQs. The point Rishi made was entirely appropriate. Labour are in hock to the trade unions. Without the unions, they would be bankrupt. And I'm afraid that is why they couldn't bring themselves this week to put the general public first and vote for legislation which would ensure that there is a minimum standard of service on the trains waiting for an ambulance when strike action takes place. Mm. The, the problem is, though, that we've got the RC who are on strike today, with Pat Cullen, uh, who is the General Secretary, saying, I'd love to see minimum service contracts. And that would ensure, perhaps, that some of the 47,000 nurses' vacancies are actually filled, that there are sufficient staff in the NHS to provide a minimum service. She says, let's do it. I take the point entirely. We've spoken about the NHS, the winter challenges, getting those COVID backlogs down. The Prime Minister does have a plan for that. For example, in my own constituency, we've got a brilliant £25 million new investment in A&E at the front door to try and smooth that transition from the ambulances via A&E and getting people out in the community for social care. So that's what we're delivering. We have brought in short-term measures as well to ease the NHS, and I think the initial signs are that that is being successful too. Right. One line of defence that perhaps was rather uncomfortable for, for Labour was the mm. fact that then Rishi Sunak pointed to the situation in Wales with the Labour yeah. administration where the waiting times are even worse. Healthcare's devolved, but the money isn't, is it? So right. we're all fighting for that same pot of money and they've got the same problems as we've mm. had. I mean, Scott's talking about his A&E and getting investment. That sounds great. I don't even have an A&E in Canterbury. My, my constituents have to go Ashford, all the way it? to Ashford yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or QEQM, which is in Margate. Mm. So healthcare in East Kent is an absolute 
absolute disaster. And, you know, you mentioned Pat Cullen, but I think she's been really reasonable. Dawn Butler made the point that she's saying, please, can we get around the table? You know, she's willing to... You know, we have this image, don't we, of union bosses being quite sort of bolshy, mm. but she doesn't seem to have been like that at all, and yet we just need those conversations. And are we getting an indication by uh, Rishi Sunak going so much on minimum so safety levels that this is going to be the line of attack for them now, that they will yeah. press ahead with this legislation yeah. to try and restrict, as the unions see it, their ability to take industrial action? Yeah, and I'm really uncomfortable. I can understand what he's saying, what the points are. We have to have this minimal level of service. Nobody I've ever met in the NHS wants to go on strike. Mm. They wouldn't be doing it unless there was no choice. Well, if we have could, to could have we... this minimum level of service, why didn't you vote for it a few days ago? I mean, what we're talking about here is a series of coordinated strikes, many of whom are trying, the union bowels are trying to bring the government down. That's their ultimate aim. Let's be entirely honest about that. Well, do you think Pat Cullen's trying to bring the government down? I said some of the union leaders, right. particularly, for example, the RMT and others, not necessarily the, the, the nurses, I have to say. But what we're talking about with a minimum service bill is making sure if you phone an ambulance on a strike date, you can expect one to turn up. That is not much to ask for the taxpaying general public. That's why three to one people in Poland support this proposition. And I'm absolutely staggered that Labour have walked into this trap, coordinated and orchestrated by their union barons, and they're not supporting it. It's absolutely ridiculous. But who would it apply to? Would you apply it to nurses? Would you apply it to junior doctors? Or is it just those blue light ambulances? Where do you draw the line? Well, that, that's in technicality of... Well, it's a big technicality, isn't it? That, that's in the bill. And two days ago, the uh, business secretary laid down how the bill would work. It's formulaic, so essentially the detail comes later. We are discussing the principle at the moment, but I think my constituents are quite clear in supporting this bill because they want to get to work on the trains on the morning. If they need an ambulance on the strike date, they need a legal guarantee that it will turn up. And that's what Labour have denied the taxpaying general public. But, but isn't, let's not isn't forget. It, as, as Keir Starmer says, a deflection from the fact that the yeah. ambulances aren't turning up anyway exactly. because the, the, the health service is not being supported exactly. sufficiently. Well, it's not a deflection at all. There are issues in the NHS, right. including with ambulances. We need to work through those in the longer term. But this is a standalone bill about protecting the general public and ensuring that they can have a bit of certainty that an ambulance will turn up. And Labour have walked into this trap right. where they've voted against it. The very, NHS very quick words to come back. biggest employer. These are also voting voters and the general public. They're not a separate body. They're the people you need votes from as well. They're not just a sort of homogenous group and they need to eat and they need to be able to pay their bills. Um, thank you both uh, for the moment, Rachel and Scott. I'm just going to bring uh, some breaking news in, uh, still on the political front, because uh, the former Cabinet Minister, George Eustace, uh, is the latest uh, Conservative to announce plans to stand down mm -hmm. as an MP at the next general election. The former Environment Secretary, uh, representing Camborne and Redruth and Cornwall, said, by the time of the next election, I will have been in politics for 25 years, including uh, almost 15 as uh, an MP. I will also be 53, and I want the opportunity to do a final career outside politics. So I've decided not to seek re-election. This has been a difficult decision for me, he said. I feel a deep bond to the area where my family has lived for more than 400 years, and it's been an honour to represent my hometowns, but important that the Conservatives are able to select a new candidate in good time. So that news just coming in. Well, let's get a little bit more uh, analysis of what's been going on uh, at Westminster from our political reporter, Catherine Foster, who's joining us now uh, from Westminster. D just uh, to reflect on that uh, news about George Eustace, first of all, uh, Catherine, the latest in a number of Tory MPs uh, to throw the towel in. Yes, certainly well over a dozen now Conservative MPs have said that they will not stand for re-election at the next election. Sajid Javid, the previous Health Secretary, among uh, the, the bigger, more high profile. And George Eustace now, as we're hearing, who was Environment Secretary. But although he's been in Parliament for, as he says, nearly 15 years, his seat is certainly very vulnerable, as indeed are mm. hundreds of Conservative seats at the moment, if you look at the polls. His majority 
had already shrunk at the last election. So if he was to stand, the chances are that he would lose. So I suppose he's looked at the way the wind has blown and is blowing and has thought, do you know what, I'm not going to fight this. I've had a good run and I'm going to do something else with my life. So yeah. not entirely surprising, but not, of course, the look that the Conservative Party wants to project. They want to look at a party that is still very much in play and can win the next election. Yeah. Uh, we were just discussing here about PMQs then. Uh, interesting that the attack line was not on nurses and the strike today, but on ambulance waiting times. And quite a novel approach from Keir Starmer uh, in terms of detailing these uh, reaction times uh, on the various uh, towns and cities across the UK. Uh, but Scott here in the studio is saying that perhaps he hadn't really managed to hit home with those points. Well, it was an interesting approach, isn't it? Because we were thinking on oh, nurses' strikes bound to be something on strikes. And instead, he went on ambulance workers. And rather than the strikes, the general state of the NHS, which he said was now in lethal chaos, that this is what the Conservative government had done to it. Rishi Sunak, of course, hit back and said, uh, you know, to huge cheers for the Conservative benches, then why don't you support our minimum, minimum service level legislation? But of of course, that's not what Keir Starmer was actually talking about, was it? He was talking about the fact that, as he said, he said it's 12.03. If you call an ambulance now, if you think you've had a heart attack, having a heart attack, how long will the ambulance take to come? We know from figures out last week that on average the target's 18 minutes, so should have been there by 20 past 12 in his, in his hypothetical example. Um, they wouldn't arrive till half past one. Labour have put out figures um, just in the last 10 minutes or so saying that one in 10 people would wait over three hours and 40 minutes. So Labour really hammering the fact that the M NHS is in an incredibly difficult position. We talk about it being in crisis every winter, don't we? Yeah. But it does does feel that it's very different this year. And so Rishi Sunak, very energetic, very positive with his answers and some big cheers, um, especially when, of course, he said the, the old favourite line about Labour being in the pocket yeah. of the union paymasters, because strikes are obviously a tricky issue for Keir Starmer. Yes, uh, a line that we hear nearly uh, every week. But uh, I think that was a police car we heard behind you, not an ambulance uh, arriving uh, after that 12.03 call. But Catherine, for the moment at Westminster, thank you for that. Uh, but let's reflect, of course, that we heard uh, questions uh, from Stephen Flynn, the SNP leader, on this uh, devolution issue and gender rights. Well, the UK government, of course, blocked that controversial Scottish gender reform bill designed to make it easier for people to change their legal gender, uh, self-determination, if you like, with UK ministers just justifying the move by saying that draft law would conflict with equality protection applying across Great Britain. Well, the first time that a, a Scottish law has been blocked uh, for affecting UK-wide uh, laws. Some fiery exchanges, some fiery exchanges in the Commons yesterday, and our guest here, Rosie Duffield, uh, asked this question of the Scotland Secretary, Alistair Jack. I welcome the government's invoking of Section 35 in this case, as the bill clearly conflicts with the Equality Act and would have repercussions for women, for women across the UK. Does the Secretary of State recognise the strength of feeling amongst women, women's rights groups and activists in Scotland that this bill seeks to allow anyone at all to, to legally self-identify as either sex and therefore enter all spaces, including those necessarily segregated by sex, such as domestic violence settings, changing rooms and prisons. And given the previous UQ, does he not understand how vitally important this is at the moment? Well, Mr. Mr. De Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think, I think the Honourable Lady deserves a lot of respect for her courage in standing up on this issue. And, and I think when, when the statement of reasons is read later today, she will be proved to be absolutely right in the things she's saying. Respect from the Scottish Secretary, but not from your own side. Tell us what happened next. Not so much. Um, I went for a drink with a few friends. Not that many of them were Labour, <laughs> I have to say, that evening. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just disappointing, isn't it, when... Every woman that stood up, those same people were heckling, not the men, even though some of them made the same point on the other side, but it was when women stood up. And uh, my friend Jess Phillips was sitting behind me and she's been accused of making faces on Twitter. She was just appalled. We were talking amongst ourselves about how every time a woman stood, we got jeered. And that's not a great look, I don't think. Is there a problem with Scottish, uh, with uh, Labour 
uh, men MPs, or is it just the issue about the, 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 the Scotland think, devolution think, bun fight, as it's been well, called? Well, you know, we're still only a third of Parliament, so it still does feel as though we're slightly in the minority. In our party, though, we're more than 50%, so I would hope that, that Labour men are used to having loud, strong women around. Have you got enough support from your own party leadership? It depends what you mean by support. Whenever this issue comes up on television, there are people in Labour Party's head office who write lines for the Labour Party uh, shadow cabinet who go on television and answer that question about whether I'm being supported. None of them ask me. They, know, they don't ask me if I'm being supported. Mm. Somebody in an office writes a line for a Labour MP saying I'm being supported. I'm not sure what that means. I haven't heard from Keir. The people in the shadow cabinet don't approach me and ask me if I'm OK or what they can do. And they don't discuss this issue with me. It's an issue I know inside out. They have advisers. Lots of them are based in London. I don't think it takes the temperature of women like me, women who vote for me and women supporting me. So you feel... A bit out on a limb, then. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not invited in for those discussions, and uh, nor are the groups of women who I know and I work with. And I think I'm right in saying that you decided not to go to the party conference in Brighton um, yeah. on advice, safety advice... A couple of years ago, yeah. ..because you, you were threatened on the, the yeah. issue of transgender rights. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't... I was just going to quietly not go. We all get threats all the time, but I knew that that particular group of people and some in Labour societies were really not going to enjoy it if I went. And I didn't want to be the headline, because that was the first year that Kiss Starmer was making a big speech as leader. And, in fact, actually, someone leaked it to the press that I wasn't going, and it became the headline. Uh, and, Scott, we have to say that you, very kindly here in the studio, did offer your support to Rosie on her, her stand that was taken in the Commons yesterday. I think Rosie really has led the way on this and she deserves tremendous respect and admiration for doing that. And the um, picture you've just painted about some of the abuse and threats you have faced on this issue for speaking out, I think, is absolutely appalling. Of course, it's only a few years ago and um, Labour members of Parliament, who were female and Jewish, also couldn't attend their party conference yeah. because of the security issues around that and ended up stepping down in Parliament as well. And the abuse and comments from some male MPs towards you from the opposition benches when you spoke yesterday was absolutely appalling. Well, I think Parliament's a far better place to be um, a female, to be gay, to be an ethnic minority than it used to be 10, 20 or yeah. 30 years ago. But I think some of the points Rosie's but is, made isn't illustrates it, we've yeah. got a long way to go. Isn't it interesting that we're talking about misogyny in the police force, with many politicians commenting on that, yeah. when it seems misogyny <laughs> is actually pretty rife in Parliament itself? I think, unfortunately, it's still rife in various different sections of society, whether that be politics, public service, business, public services. We still have a long way, to, uh, a lot more to do right. to root it out, but we are making progress. I think that has to be said. And I hope we've had a civilised disgusting in the discussion yeah. rather here in the studio rather than disgusting <laughs> behaviour that we saw in the Commons. Uh, thank you both for your time. Thank you for being thank with you. us at PMQs. Uh, so, GB News Live, continuing with me, Mark Longhurst. Don't go anywhere. Lots more to come. Uh, latest inflation figures... Uh, analyzing that. Nurses' strikes, of course, underway today, and more reactions to PMQs, and an exclusive Mark White on the County Lines gangs. All that to come. Before that, an update on the weather. Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update. You don't need me to tell you it's another cold one, a dry, sunny one for many, but we do have further wintry showers in places, heavy snow across northern Scotland and a mixture of rain, sleet and snow further west. It's actually in the east where we've got low pressure. That's pulling away, but it's still allowing the winds to be coming down from the north, hence why it is cold out there. Temperatures getting up to five or six degrees, which means the showers in the west will be more of a mixture of rain, sleet and snow and some hail. Snow mostly over the hills, but a covering in places uh, still across Wales, Western England, Northern Ireland and certainly more heavy snow showers to come across Northern Scotland. Many central and eastern areas just staying dry and sunny, but it is cold, feeling especially cold in Northern Scotland with a brisk wind. But temperatures generally four to six Celsius at best and dropping sharply this evening, which means ice is likely to be a problem where we have further wintry showers coming in for Wales, more snow likely in North Wales and perhaps into parts of northwest England along with Northern Ireland and again northern Scotland. The showers easing in the southwest, but again many central and eastern places dry and very cold. Could be some fog around as well, down to minus 10 to maybe minus 15 where there's snow lying on the ground 
in northern Scotland. And that's where most of the snow will be during Thursday. A few scattered flurries across parts of North Wales and northwest England, perhaps, and still a few wintry showers for Northern Ireland. But many areas will be dry tomorrow with sunny spells, but it will be cold temperatures again for most only three or four degrees Celsius. The winds, though, fairly light, which means the frost will return very quickly on Thursday night. Again, it could be quite icy uh, almost anywhere, but particularly where we've got the showers for Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland, where we'll continue to see the snow building up. Any sign of the cold weather ending? Well, it's going to last until at least Friday. Slowly, slowly, milder air will creep into the west during this weekend. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. And welcome back to GB News Live with me, Mark Longhurst. Coming up for you this hour, thousands of teenagers, some as young as 13, being exploited by criminal gangs to transport drugs. We'll be talking to our home security editor, Mark White, about his exclusive report. As the latest widespread nursing strike gets underway, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer locking horns at Prime Minister's questions on the NHS. We'll have reaction and the latest analysis. At least 15 people, including Ukraine's interior minister and his deputy, have been killed in a helicopter crash near the country's capital, Kyiv. We'll be speaking to a Ukrainian MP from President Zelensky's party. And as ever, get in touch at GB Views, gbnews.uk. We want to hear your take on all of today's top stories, particularly, of course, what we've heard from PMQs today. But before that, the latest headlines with Bethany. Mark, thank you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past one. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. As nurses in England stage a two-day strike, the Labour leader is urging the Prime Minister to take responsibility and admit the NHS is in crisis. Members of the Royal College of Nursing from 55 NHS trusts are walking out in a long-running dispute over pay and patient safety. The action is expected to lead to thousands of operations and appointments being cancelled. Unite also says it will announce further ambulance strike dates in their dispute over pay and staffing. Rishi Sunak insists the government is working to improve access to emergency care, but Sir Keir Starmer says patients are left waiting for hours. Mr Speaker, it's three minutes past twelve. If somebody phones, if somebody phones 999 now because they have chest pains and fear it might be a heart attack, 
when would the Prime Minister expect an ambulance to arrive? Mr Speaker, it's absolutely right that people can rely on the emergency services when they need them, and that's why we are rapidly implementing measures to improve the delivery of ambulance times and, indeed, urgent and emergency care. But I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he cares about ensuring that patients get access to life-saving emergency care when they need it, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Well, a nurse associate on the picket line told GB News he thinks the government needs to do more. Not an easy decision, but it's about time the government paid us fairly. But equally, let's forget about money for a second. You know, we need more training places for nurses. Um, and it's about time that we make the country aware how hard it is to work in what we're facing on a daily basis. The rate at which prices are rising has slowed for the second month in a row, but the cost of some food has hit a 45-year high. The Office for National Statistics says the rate of inflation fell to 10.5% in December. That's down from 10.7% the month before. It says falling fuel costs were largely behind the slowdown, with the average petrol price down by 8.3 pence per litre since last month. The government has pledged to half inflation by the end of the year, but Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says there's still a long way to go. Any country anywhere in the world with inflation over 10% is seeing it at, at frankly dangerous levels for the stability of an economy. But for families up and down the country, they are seeing food price inflation of nearly 17%. And that's causing a massive hike in the cost of the weekly shop. And what that really shows is that for us and for other countries, the most important thing is to stick to a plan to bring down inflation. Former Cabinet Minister George Eustace has become the latest Conservative MP to announce he will not stand again at the next general election. Mr Eustace said it had been an honour to represent Camborne and Redruth in Cornwall since 2010. He also served as the Environment Secretary between 2020 and last year. The MP said at the next election he'd be 53 and he's looking for another career outside of politics. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says at least 15 people have been killed in a helicopter crash near the country's capital, Kiev. The National Police Chief says Ukraine's Interior Minister, Denis Monastersky, was among those who died in the crash near a nursery in the town of Bravari. Officials say at least 29 people have also been injured, including 15 children. The cause is unknown and there's been no immediate comment from Russia. All police forces in Britain are being asked to check their officers and staff against the police national database after serving officer David Carrick was sacked from the force yesterday. The 48-year-old was fired from the Metropolitan Police after admitting to 49 criminal charges, including 24 counts of rape against 12 women over an 18-year period. The Home Office has asked for serving officers to be checked to identify if anyone has slipped through the net before vetting standards were strengthened. 106 migrants arrived in the UK yesterday in the first small boats to cross the English Channel in more than a fortnight. Bad weather has deterred any crossings since the 2nd of January. Three small boats left French beaches on Tuesday. Two made it to UK waters and were picked up by border force. The third got into difficulty near Calais and 45 people were rescued by French officials. Last year, almost 46,000 people crossed the Channel. A third of those were from Albania. You're up to date on GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. It's back to Mark. Bethany, thank you very much indeed. Let's bring you some breaking news now. And uh, with the nurses on strike today, of course, we've now got news uh, of more strikes coming from ambulance workers. This coming in from uh, the GMB in the last few minutes, uh, saying that more than 10,000 of its members, including paramedics, emergency care assistants, call handlers and other staff, will be walking out on the 6th and 20th of February and the 6th and 20th of March. In addition, they say, workers at the West Midlands Ambulance Service will strike on January the 23rd. 
while their members in the North West Ambulance Service will strike on January the 24th. Rachel Harrison, the union's national secretary, said, Ambulance workers are angry. In their own words, they are done. Our message to the government is clear. Talk, pay now. Ministers have made things worse by demonising the ambulance workers who provided life and limb cover on strike days, uh, playing political games, she said, with their scaremongering. The only way to solve this dispute is a proper pay offer. Uh, going on to say then, she said, in the face of government inaction, we are left with no choice but industrial action. GMB ambulance workers are determined they are not going to back down. It's up for this government to get serious on pay. We are waiting. Uh, we can also tell you that we are waiting for news from the Unite Union, who also represent uh, ambulance workers. Uh, they're considering their next step and are also likely to reveal their next uh, course of action this afternoon. We'll bring you that as we get it. Now, GB News can uh, reveal exclusively that at least 10,000 teenagers, some as young as 13 years old, are being exploited by criminal gangs to transport drugs for them. Well, most of these so-called county lines gangs are using Britain's rail network to carry huge quantities of illegal drugs and cash to communities across the country. Our home and security editor, Mark White, has been given exclusive access to follow a major British Transport Police-led operation going after these county lines gangs. It's the height of the morning commute in central London. And here on the underground at Euston Station, the police are out in force. They're on the hunt for the county line's criminal gangs, using the transport network to ferry drugs, cash and weapons. Upstairs in the main station concourse, other officers have stopped and arrested this young man on suspicion of drug dealing. He was found with £1,400 in cash and a cheap burner disposable phone, often used in drug deals. This countrywide operation is being led by British Transport Police and their dedicated County Lines unit. I have 70 staff that are dedicated to this type of work across the whole of the network. We vary our tactics, we vary our locations. You may not see them out there, but they are out there every day looking for criminals that are involved in County Lines activity. On board a train heading to the Midlands, this is rare access, following these plainclothes officers who are part of the County Lines task force as they look out for anything suspicious. And if you've got valuables in there, the last thing you want is just stuff being stolen, yeah? A quick chat with this passenger and it's clear he's a legitimate traveller. But in the three years this task force has been operational, these officers and their colleagues have made more than 1,500 drug seizures, recovered one and a quarter million pounds in illicit cash, and taken more than 500 weapons off the rail network. On the day we were filming, here at Birmingham's New Street station, officers arrested a young man carrying this suitcase with 10 and a half kilos of cannabis inside. Further up the line in Wolverhampton, another man and a woman were stopped carrying a suitcase, this time with six kilos of cannabis inside. More than 40% of those arrested by the County Lines Task Force over recent years were teenagers. British Transport Police now works closely with social work and children's charities to identify those who might be victims themselves. If there is a young person or a vulnerable adult and there's a crime that's taking place but we recognise actually they're a victim of exploitation, then you've got an investigation process and a safeguarding process that can run parallel. Here at Coventry Station, another team of officers are working with police dog Ash and his keen sense of smell, a key weapon in identifying those worth a closer inspection. It doesn't take him long to pinpoint a likely suspect. As these plainclothes officers searched the man, it soon cleared the police dog was bang on the money. We've got a uh, sealed bag, approximately £5,000 cash. Um, so the man, gentleman, has been arrested on suspicion of being concerned supply. So we've been taken to custody and uh, processed. So we've seized the cash. Uh, we've got two of his phones, so they'll be seized as well. With at least 600 county lines criminal gangs, 
It is a major ongoing issue for law enforcement right across the country, as our time with British Transport Police starkly illustrates. Tens of thousands of pounds worth of drugs and illicit cash seized in just a single day. Mark White, GB News on the Rail Network. Well, Mark's joining us in the studio now. I mean, extraordinary pictures and extraordinary numbers. In that, although this was a targeted operation, they clearly didn't know what they were going to find. And as you said, hundreds of thousands in terms of the, the value of the drugs and cash as well, £5,000 in one envelope. Yeah, I mean, this was just at a few stations. So Euston, uh, up in Coventry, Birmingham, Wolverhampton. Uh, and in these stations, uh, they stopped multiple people. They found that one suitcase with 10 and a half kilograms of cannabis, street value of more than £100,000. <laughs> Another suitcase being carried by a man and woman yeah. in Wolverhampton, six ki uh, kilos of cannabis, that's £60,000. And then on top of that, you've got all these individuals that are carrying wads of £5,000 in mm. cash. Now, what the police say is that this is the money they'll go and buy the drugs with or the money that they've taken from just selling uh, their shipment of drugs and they're heading back to the criminal gangs. Yeah, that. almost like a black market economy almost in terms of the, the figures involved. Yeah, I mean, it's half a billion pounds <laughs> a year the county lines trade nets the criminal gangs. Uh, it was a high of about 2,000 county lines gangs. Mm. There have been proactive police operations for a number of years now. They think that's down to 600, but it might be that, you know, that's just a more focused 600 yeah, gangs... Yeah who are still doing as much in the way of work as the 2,000 gangs mm. before them did. It is an ongoing day-to-day -day issue. And, and very organised, very sophisticated. But, of course, it's the youngsters that are being used as the drug mules, as they call them, uh, at, at the sharp end. And the, the problem is, of course, they are then inducted, if you like, into that gang culture. And it leads on to all the other issues where we see these shootings and stabbings of the gang warfare. This is all part of this same subculture. Yeah, and there's a few things to say about that. I mean, the children for them, uh, teenagers in particular, is, is very tempting because there's supposedly easy money mm. on offer from the gangs. All you need to do is we'll get you a ticket on the train. We want you to go up to, you know, Preston with this uh, shipment here in your rucksack, deliver that and take the cash back. Two train tips, uh, trips are... Uh, you know, a day away and you get whatever you get in, yeah. in, in the form of money. And it's low risk because most of these journeys on the rail network actually will go undiscovered. You're unlucky if you're caught by the police in this kind of big proactive operation that's ongoing over uh, the next few days. Um, but you're right as well that it then sucks these young people into the criminal network, working for these gangs... And the drugs, we know, fuel so much yeah. of the violence yeah. that we're seeing, Mark, in terms of stabbings and shootings as the gangs vie uh, for, for, for turf and, and for a share of this lucrative trade. So, so given that, as well as these operations where they just try and, and uh, hit part of the, the transport network in, in one stage, how are they succeeding in terms of identifying the Mr Biggs and all the organised crime behind it and, and tackling out? Because we've talked before, of course, about... Romanian and Albanian gangs involved in, in the drug smuggling? Yeah, well, we know, for instance, that Albanian crime groups are increasingly taking over a lot of the cannabis farms mm -hmm. around the country. Still a big issue for the Vietnamese crime groups who run many of the cannabis farms in the north of the country, but uh, the Albanian gangs increasingly inserting themselves into that market as well. And for the police, well, it's just a matter of... Uh, an ongoing struggle, really, yeah, to get yeah. the intelligence that they need to try to put these people away. But obviously operations like this that we're witnessing from that very capable unit mm. that British Transport Police have dedicated just to county lines right. with 70 officers operating right across the country in these targeted operations. Uh, what they will do, obviously, if they uh, detain someone, especially a young person, they'll arrange for safeguarding for that person if they're treated as someone actually who's more of a victim than uh, a criminal in yeah, this yeah, yeah. case. But they can gather key evidence from the their mobile phone. Mm. Uh, they can look at to, to who they're calling. And all of that evidence picture is really important in trying to get to the bigwigs, as yeah, you indeed. say.
Mark, thank you very much indeed for bringing us uh, yet another exclusive, of course, uh, on that. Thank you very much indeed. Now, of course, we've got uh, the nurses' action underway today. Thousands of nurses in more than 55 NHS trusts across England staging a two-day strike in their dispute over paying conditions. Emergency care being provided, but uh, patients facing disruption to many operations and various appointments, including potential cancellations. And, of course, as we've just updated you, the GMB, GMB rather, announcing that ambulance workers will stage fresh strikes on the February the 6th and 20th and March the 6th and 20th. Unite also expected to announce further ambulance strikes this afternoon, bring you those dates as we get them. But let's go live now to St Thomas's Hospital in London and uh, news reporter Ellie Costello uh, is there. Uh, and Ellie, certainly we've been getting this message from the, the health unions that they are growing increasingly determined to see this through. <laughs> Yes, good afternoon to you, Mark. And they certainly are determined and they certainly are loud. We're outside King's College Hospital now in South London where the freezing temperatures and the prospect of no pay for these nurses hasn't stopped. A very loud, a very lively, a very large picket line forming behind me. It must be said it's almost like a carnival atmosphere here today. You can see the drums uh, and nurses that have come out, many of them actually on shore shift today. They've come out on their breaks and their lunch breaks uh, to have their voices heard. Of course, this is the ongoing dispute over pay. This is day one of the 48-hour walkout this week. And I've been speaking to nurses on the picket line today. They've been telling me that their real pay is down £5,000 since 2010. That is in part down to inflation. One in three have difficulty affording food and heating in their homes in this cost of living crisis and there is a 50,000 nurses shortfall in England at the moment. So those are just some of the reasons why they have joined the picket line today. They've been talking to me all morning and this is what they told me. I'm on strike because enough is enough. Um, we are so frustrated as nurses that we're not being listened to, we've not been valued, we've not been appreciated, we've been through, before the pandemic, we've been having a rough, rough time, and during the COVID, we picked ourselves up and we carried on and we soldiered on, and now with the cost of living and everything else, you know, enough is enough. Um, we're, we're struggling, there's not enough of us on the wars, there's not enough to do anything, and it's just such a bad time being a nurse at the moment. I think everyone knows that it's not an easy decision to make to strike. So when it's required, people realise it's clearly important. That's why we're out here. And are you both frontline nurses? Are you both in yeah. departments? What, is, what are the conditions like for you? What's brought you to the picket line? It's, just, it's be, you know, better staffing. Yeah. You know, we need to retain and keep our staff. We need to feel valued. And that's what we were out here to do, to show. And hopefully get everyone else to see and hopefully the government. <laughs> Well, every nurse I spoke to here today, Mark, said that it was a very difficult decision for them to come out. It was the first time that they have been on strike in their entire careers. And, of course, uh, they felt guilt for their patients, but they said they can't uh, produce the great standard of care that they should be doing whilst conditions are the way that they are. They said this is a last resort and things have to change in the NHS. But it must be said, you're going to hear uh, the sound of horns here. They go right on cue because they have been quite continuous here uh, throughout the day. It does seem that the public are very much on the side of the nurses. A new poll out by Ipsos today said that three in five people blame the government for this dispute and not the nurses. That's certainly uh, heard here just by the sound of, of vehicles tooting their horn in support. There will be some disruption to patients, Mark. That is clear. Around 30,000 appointments were disrupted or cancelled in the December strikes, we're going to see the same sort of disruption yeah. uh, in this 48-hour walkout as well. That, of course, is frustrating uh, for patients, especially those perhaps on a cancer or an operation waiting list who've been waiting several months uh, to see a doctor or, or have that operation. Uh, speaking in The Independent this morning, Steve Barkley, the health secretary, said that he recognises the cost of living pressures, but that the current uh, demand from nurses of 19%, although they have said that they'd be willing to compromise 
is unaffordable. Uh, but he does say he's looking forward to constructive conversations. And the nurses are now saying the similar thing. They're looking forward to constructive conversations. Hopefully those conversations can be fruitful and we won't see the strikes that are currently planned uh, for February. Ellie, at uh, King's End, South London, with that huge cheer we heard for the ambulance uh, going by as well, of course, uh, with the ambulance workers indicating more strikes. Thank you for that uh, in South London. Let's move down to the South Coast now and our reporter there, Ray Addison, at the uh, Royal Sussex County Hospital uh, in Brighton. Uh, and also we'll be speaking in a moment to our West Midlands reporter, Jack Carson, at St George's Hospital in Stafford. But, uh, Ray, first to you. Again, we can see a, a, a huge picket line there behind you uh, up uh, in Kemp Town in Brighton. Yes, good afternoon, Mark. You joined me at a very, very noisy picket line here outside the Royal Sussex County Hospital in Brighton. Started off with about 60, 70 people. We're easily up to 300 people now with uh, the picket line actually li lining both sides of the road here outside the Royal Sussex County. Joining me uh, is Karen Bradley. She's a picket supervisor. Uh, if you come in for a moment, Karen, she's also a clinic clinical practice educator as well as been in nursing for 37 years. Karen and thank you for, for speaking to GB News. Um, what can you tell us about how nursing has changed during your career? During my career, nursing has changed, you know, exponentially. I mean, we started off um, being... Um God, the noise is so noisy, isn't it? Um, just as primary care is giving very basic care, but now we're actually looking after people with very complex needs. They're more vulnerable. They're more technologically needing advanced care and supervision. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's so noisy. I can hardly hear myself think. And so, you know, we're not needing to be more... We're not just nurses. We're not just caring. We're actually being technicians. We're having to have a much more diverse level of knowledge and understanding and education. Nurses have also evolved and they've taken over a lot of the jobs that doctors once did. So we've got nurses now who are very well educated, taken along lots of very... Oh. Well, you actually teach nurses. You're a clinical practice educator. So what are you seeing about the different types of people who are now entering the field of nursing? Has it changed? Is, are the numbers down? And uh, what is life like for a nurse today? So, yeah, my, after spending uh, about 36 years actually being clinical, um, I took the big step to move into education so I could actually share my knowledge, my expertise with the nurses of the future. Um, nurses nowadays are coming into the profession really quite young. They're undertaking a degree at the same time as taking on practical nursing, learning nursing skills and knowledge and that in itself is quite a, a big ask of them so it's a very tricky degree to take on, that's not funded. We had a halo effect during COVID and we had a real leap in numbers but that again has worn off because the issue that we have is we bring nurses into the profession we train them, we look after them, we nurture them and then we let them out into the big wide world once they're qualified <laughs> Sorry, it's just so noisy and the, the soup and the supervision and the support. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to hear you. And it's very difficult to hear me. Um, a huge turnout, as I said here, Mark. Uh, lots of nurses here on strike, up to 300, and that will continue tomorrow, where they're telling me it's going to be even bigger. Ray, thank you very much indeed for that. And, of course, that extraordinary amount of vocal support from the uh, drivers going past there, the Royal Sussex and Kemp Town in Brighton. Uh, so let's head uh, down or up to West Midlands uh, to Stafford St George's Hospital. Jack is there. And, uh, Jack, are you seeing and hearing the same sort of things there with this um, straw poll, what seems to be huge public support with the car horns going off? Well, definitely. It's a bit of a smaller picket line than it, uh, than it is down south here, but plenty of support from cars driving by, beeping their horns, showing the, the public support, but the nurses themselves are united. Uh, they've been singing, they've been chanting um, and showing how together they are um, in this fight uh, for better pay and better working conditions. Of course, we know um, that one of the things they're, they're striking for is, is better staffing on wards. They say that if, if, the, if there was better pay and uh, more incentive, 
if then those newly qualified nurses would come into the NHS rather than opt for other things like agencies where they know they can get better pay and so that's what the RCN want to meet with the government to get, to get a better a, a better pay deal. Steve Barkley though saying that um, the offer that the RCN uh, want of uh, a 5% above inflation um, is, un, is an unaffordable pay rise which will stoke inflation even more but Pat Cullen the RCN uh, General Secretary saying that today's strike action by nursing staff is a modest escalation before that sharp increase in more industrial action as we get into February as well. She says that people aren't dying because nurses are striking. Nurses are striking because people are dying. As we heard from uh, Elliot, Ellie just a short while ago that around 30,000 appointments had to be rescheduled because of the strikes uh, in December and there's going to be a lot more appointments that have to be rescheduled because of this action as well as the action into February. But people can still get care um, if their appointments haven't been cancelled um, and NHS saying that people just use 111 and 999 in those life-threatening cases. Jack, thank you very much indeed for uh, updating us there and staff and, of course, uh, Ray in Brighton as well. Uh, more to come throughout the afternoon. Thank you both very much indeed for those updates. And just to mention, of course, that breaking news that we've got the ambulance workers uh, now announcing strikes as well. Still to come, the latest on the inflation figures today with uh, our business and economics editor, Liam Halligan, making sense of it all. But let's take a quick break now. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me. Lawrence Fox on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to GB News Live. Now, council tax was introduced some 30 years ago to help local authorities to pay for their everyday necessities. But now research by money.co.uk shows that if you live in the north of the country, you are likely to be paying a lot more. It recently found that Rutland Council in the East Midlands has one of the highest council tax rates in the country. How is that possible? Well, our national reporter Theo Chicombo has been finding out. It's used to pay for waste collection, street lighting, road maintenance and more. How much you pay is dependent on your circumstances, which valuation band your property is in and how much the council needs to fund its services. Here in the East Midlands, there's mixed views on how much they pay. I know the councils have got work to do. I think partly with Rutland it's because it's such a small county that they don't perhaps get the economies of scale that other places will get but um, I think you know the, there needs to be some accountability for where all the money's going I think. It's difficult on the working sort of people like myself really I would say. Is it 
can you compare it to London? Well, maybe not with two different places, but it's certainly high here. I can't deny that. You know, with everything else going on, <laughs> trying to make your pension stretch, you know, to cover everything is a bit too much, really, I think, you know. Um, it's, I've lived on here all my life and it's got worse over the years. If you live in a house here in Rutland in East Midlands, your council tax is around £2,300 a year, making it one of the most expensive in the country. And it's set to increase again. Whereas if you live in the South East, in London or here in Westminster, the average council tax is cheaper than those who live in the Midlands or in many parts of Northern England. Data by money.co.uk suggests that council tax bills are 20% higher in the north of England than in London, even though homes here in the capital are three times more expensive. The average band D bill in London this year is £1,696 compared to £2,060 in the north of England. At this local authority, they say council tax counts for 78% of their budget and that households here receive £504 from central government almost half of what other parts of the country receive. In an ideal world, we would be absolutely saying, right, well, we're going to have a council tax freeze. That really wouldn't be fiscally responsible because we would end up with um, some really, really difficult to make decisions in the coming years, which would actually negatively impact our residents even further because we would have to look at the uh, level of service provision on some of our key core services. While an additional £33,000 support fund is available for households who need it the most, leadership here argue local government funding needs to be revised to even out disparities and make the system fairer. The H Comba, GB News. Well, coming up uh, after your news update, we'll have the latest on the helicopter crash in Ukraine that's killed at least 17 people, including four children, the Minister of Internal Affairs and the First Deputy Minister. A helicopter coming down near a kindergarten east of Kyiv. First, though, those latest headlines with Bethany. Mark, thank you. It's 34 minutes past one. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. As nurses in England stage a two-day strike, the Labour leader is urging the Prime Minister to take responsibility and admit the NHS is in crisis. Members of the Royal College of Nursing from 55 NHS trusts are walking out in a long-running dispute over pay and patient safety. The action is expected to lead to thousands of operations and appointments being cancelled. Rishi Sunak insists the government is working working to improve access to emergency care, but Sakia Starmer says patients are left waiting for hours. Meanwhile, thousands of ambulance workers are to stage a new strike action in the coming weeks in their ongoing dispute over pay and staffing. 10,000 members of the GMB union, including paramedics, emergency care assistants and call handlers, will walk out on the 6th and 20th of both February and March. The union says following government inaction, they've been left with no choice. Unite also says it will announce further ambulance strike dates soon. The rate at which prices are rising has slowed for a second month in a row, but the cost of some food has hit a 40-year high. The Office for National Statistics says the rate of inflation fell to 10.5% in December. That's down from 10.7% the month before. It says falling fuel costs were largely behind the slowdown, with the average petrol price down by 8.3% a litre last month. All police forces in Britain are being asked to check their officers and staff against the National Police Database. It's after serving officer David Carrick was sacked from the force yesterday. The 48-year-old was fired from the Metropolitan Police after admitting to 49 criminal charges, including 24 counts of rape against 12 women over an 18-year period. The Home Office has asked for serving officers to be checked to identify anyone who might have slipped through the net before vetting standards were strengthened. We're on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Mark will be back in a second. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us 
Across the entire United Kingdom, we cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay, believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, we've had the latest inflation figures today from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, the price rises in the UK slowing for the second month in a row, uh, but the consumer price index still at 10.5% in the 12 months to December 2022, down from 10.7% in November, but still not quite in single figures. And if anyone isn't quite sure what inflation is at this stage, here's the Chancellor trying to break it down. Well, what these figures show is that there is still a long way to go in the battle against inflation. Any country anywhere in the world with inflation over 10 percent is seeing it at, at frankly dangerous levels for the stability of an economy. But for families up and down the country, they are seeing food price inflation of nearly 17 percent. And that's causing a massive hike in the cost of the weekly shop. And what that really shows is that for us and for other countries, the most important thing is to stick to a plan to bring down inflation. The Prime Minister said that he wants to halve inflation in the coming year. And for families and businesses, it's absolutely essential that we stick to that plan. Well, that was Jeremy Hunt with his explanation, the Chancellor. How about our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money? And your explanation is petrol prices, I guess, fuel prices have allowed it to drop. But we were talking yesterday about maybe something in single figures. We're not quite there yet. Yeah, I thought it would be lower than this. And this just goes to show that inflation is not transitory, contrary to what the Bank of England was telling us yeah, yeah. for many, many months. Let's have a look at some of the numbers. There are lots of numbers floating around. The ONS, the Office for National Statistics, told us this morning that inflation, Mark, in December, the consumer price index was 10.5% higher than in December 2021. That's down but only slightly from an 11... A, 10.7 figure in November. Back in October, of course, inflation was 11.1%, mm. that 41-year high. Breaking down that December number, you can see that f food and non-alcoholic beverages up 16.9%. That's the 17% increase in the price of food shopping that the Chancellor was referring to. Fuel prices there, still 11.5% annual inflation. Yeah. That's down, actually, from where it was, but still pretty chunky above the rate of inflation as a whole. And then some things in the basket of goods that the, C, the ONS monitors were, of course, below that average figure. Transport, we can see, that's 
uh, train fares, bus fares and so on, 6.9% inflation, pr still very, very chunky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And recreation and culture, 4.8% inflation, because, of course, lots of, lots of theme parks, lots of attractions are basically cutting costs to try and get people through the door yeah, yeah, when yeah. cash is tight. And, you know, when we talk about the cost of living crisis, which it still is in terms of, of how people are feeling, uh, the money going in their pocket, I mean, there's some eye-watering figures. So I know you've touched on this before. The annual figures up to December 22, milk up 46%. Unbelievable. Olive oil, 39.5%. Pasta, which, as you say, is a staple for many families, up 29.1%. Which is why you and I have discussed this a lot, yeah. a lot, Mark. I've been saying for months and months and months, and I'm sure GB News viewers and listeners are as we say, nodding from the waist in agreement. I don't think that the idea that inflation, the cost of mm. living, is only 10.7%, 10.5% yeah. higher than a year ago stacks up. Yeah, yeah. I think the real increase in the cost of living is far, far more, particularly for low-income families who disproportionately spend on food, which where there's been lots of inflation there, and on fuel, on yeah, filling yeah, up their yeah. van with diesel. You know, diesel costs are still out, you know, stratospheric, even though oil prices around the world have come down to below where they were before Putin invaded Ukraine. Yeah, and let's not forget that the government's target for the Bank of England Two. is 2%. Oh, no. and, and, and Hunt is indicating, well, you know, we want it to, to halve to about 5%. Does that mean that we're still going to see the Bank of England pushing on interest rates? I mean, we've got a meeting in February. A lot of economists saying we could still see another okay. half percent increase. Two, two, two things how the sort of the politics of this yeah. inflation number it's still a very high number that means the government is going to have a harder time convincing unions to accept lower wage rises yeah, yeah. because the cost of living crisis is easing it is a bit but not a lot so that's the first thing this number is not helpful to the government in getting those strikes resolved the second important thing is that you have a situation where the Bank of England has raised interest rates from 0.1% not so long ago. They're now 3.5%. Uh, 3.5%, yeah. yeah. This is a big increase. Uh, we were expecting maybe a quarter point increase on Thursday, the 2nd of February, when the Monetary Policy mm. Committee makes its next announcement. But with inflation you know, not coming down very much, I think we could see, I hate to say this, another half percent, you know, 50 right. basis point, 50 percentage, yeah. point, five percentage point increase to uh, four percent in early February. And, and perhaps the government doubling down on this line that we've got to stop inflation being embedded, as they say. That's how, the, so, that's yeah. how they will try and interpret yeah. the number. That, they will say, look, inflation is still really high. Mm. Imagine how high it would be if we awarded 10 percent pay rises across the public sector that rippled out into the private sector. Those firms would then have to pass those costs on. You get a wage price spiral because yeah. prices go up, wages go up, prices go up even more, as happened in the 1970s. Now, I see you've, you've brought your very stylish GB News coffee cup. Absolutely. In the studio. Not, not the polystyrene one, which I'm very disappointed with because, let's reflect, the Treasury uh, released this video of the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt this morning uh, using such coffee cups to explain inflation. But he's faced a bit of a backlash from opposition parties in Westminster. Liberal Democrats' Treasury spokesperson Sarah Olney comparing him to Mr Bean. Why don't we have a quick watch and listen to Mr Coffee Bean? Hi. Can I get a flat white, please? Of course. While my coffee is being made, let me tell you what we're doing to halve inflation. I'm afraid coffee is getting more expensive. A year ago, it would have been around £2.50, but now it's gone up to nearly three pounds a cup and we've taken very difficult decisions to balance the nation's books so that markets have confidence and don't punish the uk with higher interest rates that mean families with mortgages have to pay more and that's what's happening and that's our plan thank you well perhaps i ought to apologize to the charles because i think that's your paper and not polystyrene. However, um, <laughs> we've got the University of Nottingham politics professor emeritus Stephen Fielding saying, I hope he recycled those cups that he wasted. I mean, it's, you know... It, it, you know it, it, it's all a jolly game, isn't it, for journalists... But, it, and, but it's not for the public. And the That's politics. The problem, yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. people yeah. are frightened about, you know, can they buy their kids' shoes? Yeah. Can they buy a school uniform? Can they pay a soaring electricity bill? Um, of course, the Lib Dems will try and get an angle on the Chancellor because he's not, you know, green and mm. and uh, and, all, and all the rest of it. Um, but 
I thought actually some parts of the Chancellor's video were a little bit disingenuous because he talked about uh, inflation stemming from lockdown. Yes, that's mm. true. Supply chain problems, a big wall of pent-up demand, that pushed up prices. And he talked about uh, price rises stemming from, of course, the war in Ukraine. Absolutely. External absolutely. With, pressures, yeah. Even though we were already at a 30-year high for inflation in January last year, which was before the war in, in Ukraine. What he didn't mention is quantitative easing. That is the rather tongue-tied term to describe when the Bank of England basically conjures up lots of money from nowhere... And puts it into the system. And puts yeah. it into the system, lending, basically buying bonds, basically financing government spending. They'd, they'd deny that, but that is the undeniable impact of quantitative easing. That money goes into the system. Inflation, as economic textbooks will tell you, is, you know, too much money chasing few too goods. So if you increase the amount of money, as the Bank of England has enormously, yeah. you will get inflation. And I would like to see our political media class talking a lot more about the implications of that massive expansion of Bank of England liquidity on inflation. What, too much for too long? Yeah, we did, we did quant quantitative easing when it were, began after the 2008 financial crisis. It was meant to be a £50 billion yeah. programme, an emergency programme. You probably reported it on the, on the, at the time, yeah. Mark. I, I certainly did, wrote columns about it and everything. Mm. It, it turned into a £425 billion programme over the next 10 years. Like because, a sugar rush for the economy. Because, to because the it, financial yeah. markets yeah. liked it, it yeah. kept stocks and shares mm. buzzing mm. and high, and the government liked it because it meant yeah. their borrowing costs were low. Guess what, Mark? In the two years of lockdown, we did more quantitative easing than we did in the 10 years after the Previously, global financial yeah. crisis. Yeah. A massive increase in Bank of England liquidity that's yeah. gone into the system, funding furlough, funding business support loans directly into the bank accounts yeah. of firms and households. I think that is at least in part where this inflation right, is coming okay. from. And where are we on them buying all those bonds back, trying to row back on that? And, and how soon will that actually perhaps have an effect? Buying all those bonds back is what's known as quantitative tightening. Mm. Trust me. What that means is that it makes it harder for the government to sell its bonds... Exactly. ..because the Bank exactly. of England's also selling bonds On the back market. into yeah. to the market. Yeah. And that's precisely what happened around the time of Liz Truss's mini-budget. And I don't right. like to, you know, go over past grievances, but you'll find a lot of people in financial markets, a lot of people who support a kind of pro-growth, more free market yeah, 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 agenda yeah. in the Conservative Party, saying that they feel aggrieved because they feel that that quasi-quateng quasi -quateng Liz Trust mini-budget failed, led to havoc on financial markets, at least in part because at that time the Bank of England was trying to unwind some of that QE at precisely the time when the government was talking about more borrowing. So, now, that's so, one for future historians, yeah, yeah. but I'm just marking everyone's card. All in the timing. <laughs> right, and that would be a few more coffee cups to explain that. Anyway, uh, Liam, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, the NHS, uh, the key battleground during Prime Minister's questions a little earlier. Uh, Labour leader Sakir Starmer calling on Rishi Sunak to admit that the health crisis was in crisis. Ambulance delays particularly, he was pointing out, hospital bed shortages, two analyst strikes. But in response, the Prime Minister said it was not about politics, pointing to the fact that the NHS was dealing with unprecedented challenges. Also insisting that everyone was doing their best to reduce waiting times. Let's remind you of the key moments. For one week, will he stop blaming others, take some responsibility, and just admit, under his watch, the NHS is in crisis, isn't it? Well, Mr Speaker, I noticed the one place the honourable gentleman didn't mention was Wales. Where we know ambulance times are even worse than they are in England, Mr Speaker. The reason that he is not putting patients first when it comes to ambulance waiting times is because he is simply in the pockets of his union paymaster. Will he stop the excuses, stop shifting the blame, stop the political games and simply tell us when will he sort out these delays and get back to the 18-minute wait? Yeah. 
but he talks about political games. He is a living, ex- living example of playing political games when it comes to people's health care. I've already mentioned what's been going on in Wales. Is he confident in the Labour-run Wales NHS that nobody is suffering right now? Of course they are, Mr Speaker, because the NHS everywhere is under pressure. What we should be doing is supporting those doctors and nurses to make the changes that we are doing to bring the care to those people. But I'll ask him this. If he is so, so concerned, so concerned about making sure that the Stephanies of the future get the cares they need, why? Why is he denying those families the guarantee of emergency life-saving care? Deflect, blame others, never take responsibility. Just like last week, he won't say when he's going to deliver the basic minimum service levels people need. Mr Speaker, over the 40 minutes or so that these sessions tend to last, 700 people will call an ambulance. Two will be reporting a heart attack. Four will be reporting a stroke. But instead of the rapid help they need, many will wait and wait and wait. So if he won't answer any questions, will he at least apologise for the lethal chaos under his watch? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he he asks about the minimum safety levels. We we will deliver them as soon as we can pass them. Why won't he vote for them, first of all? But Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, we are we are delivering on the people's priorities. As we've seen this week, the honourable gentleman will just say anything if the politics suits him. It's as simple as that. He will break promises left, right and centre. If we are going to deliver for the British people, people need to have strong convictions. But when it comes to the honourable gentleman, he isn't just for the free movement of people, he's also got the free movement of principles. So another spirited uh, PMQ session in the Commons a little earlier. Now, let's take you uh, up north with thousands of new homes to be built on regenerated brownfield land in Lancaster. Some £60 million being made available to councils to revive the land and make way for brand new homes. Well, that funding will mean that there uh, be thousands of new jobs, we're told, and uh, could drive local growth and uh, level up the country. Joining us now, our North West reporter Sophie Reaper in Lancaster. Um, Sophie, just to reflect, I, I gather that they don't want to call things levelling up anymore. They call it stepping up, gauging up or enhancing communities. Um, how do they think that's going to enhance the community there in Lancaster? Well, whatever they call it, they're really quite grateful for the money. I'm here in Lancaster today where £60 million has been promised today by the Department of Leveling Up, but Lancaster actually received their money in November of last year. Uh, £35 million was made available in the first part of the Brownfield Rejuvenation Plan, and they received £2.7 million of it. Other places up in the north that received money are places like Blackburn, Chorley, Wigan, but here in Lancaster, that 2.7 million is going to be used to rejuvenate where I'm stood here, locally known as the Canal Quarter. So what that means is over the next few years, 580 new homes will be built, but it goes so much further than just new housing, although that is, of course, of major importance. It also will do things like the car park where I'm stood will become a main plaza to create socio-economic growth. The brewery, which is just over my right hand shoulder will become a landmark to celebrate Lancaster's heritage. So although this housing and this upgrade of Brownfield sites is of major importance, it goes beyond just housing. It's about businesses. It's about bringing money into city centres. But what it's mostly about is levelling up places outside London and the South East. What could be better than buying a new house next to a brewery? I suppose uh, some people may reflect. I I really don't know, to be quite honest with you. I'm not sure it'll be functioning, but (laughs) there's plenty of pubs and bars in Lancaster (laughs) otherwise. (laughs) A good selling point anyway. Sophie, thanks for joining us there at a very sunny Lancaster. Thank you very much indeed. Well, you've been watching GB News Live uh, with, of course, all the politics of the day with PMQs. Don't go anywhere because uh, plenty more to come in this final hour of the programme, uh, including a latest look at the weather. What's it doing out there? 
Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update. You don't need me to tell you it's another cold one, a dry, sunny one for many, but we do have further wintry showers in places, heavy snow across northern Scotland and a mixture of rain, sleet and snow further west. It's actually in the east where we've got low pressure. That's pulling away, but it's still allowing the winds to be coming down from the north, hence why it is cold out there. Temperatures getting up to five or six degrees, which means the showers in the west will be more of a mixture of rain, sleet and snow and some hail. Snow mostly over the hills, but a covering in places uh, still across Wales, Western England, Northern Ireland and certainly more heavy snow showers to come across northern Scotland. Many central and eastern areas just staying dry and sunny, but it is cold, feeling especially cold in northern Scotland with a brisk wind. But temperatures generally four to six Celsius at best and dropping sharply this evening, which means ice is likely to be a problem where we have further wintry showers coming in for Wales. More snow likely in North Wales and perhaps into parts of northwest England, along with Northern Ireland and again northern Scotland. The showers easing in the southwest, but again, many central and eastern places dry and very cold. Could be some fog around as well, down to minus 10 to maybe minus 15 where there's snow lying on the ground in northern Scotland. And that's where most of the snow will be during Thursday. A few scattered flurries across parts of North Wales and northwest England perhaps, and still a few wintry showers for Northern Ireland. But many areas will be dry tomorrow with sunny spells, but it will be cold temperatures again for most only three or four degrees Celsius. The winds though fairly light, which means the frost will return very quickly on Thursday night. Again, it could be quite icy uh, almost anywhere, but particularly where we've got the showers for Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland, where we'll continue to see the snow building up. Any sign of the cold weather ending? Well, it's gonna last until at least Friday. Slowly, slowly milder air will creep into the west during this weekend. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to GB News Live. It's uh, two o'clock and uh, I'm Mark Longhurst bringing you all the latest. And this hour, a GB News exclusive for you. Thousands of teenagers, some as young as 13, being exploited by criminal gangs to transport drugs on Britain's rail network. We'll be talking to our home and security editor, Mark White, about his exclusive report. More strike misery as thousands of ambulance workers now expected to walk out on four days during February and March as thousands of nurses begin their two-day stoppage today. 
Well, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer locked horns over precisely that, the state of the NHS. At Prime Minister's questions today, we'll have the latest reaction and analysis. At least 15 people, including Ukraine's interior minister and his deputy, and several children have been killed in a helicopter crash near the country's capital, Kyiv. We'll be speaking to a Ukrainian MP from President Zelensky's party. And don't forget to get in touch with us, gbviews at gbnews.uk, with your take on today's top stories. But let's get the latest news headlines now with Bethany. Mark, thank you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past two. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. As nurses in England stage a two-day strike, the Labour leader is urging the Prime Minister to take responsibility and admit the NHS is in crisis. Members of the Royal College of Nursing from 55 NHS trusts are walking out in a long-running dispute over pay and patient safety. The action is expected to lead to thousands of operations and appointments being cancelled. A nurse associate on the picket line told you News, he thinks the government should do more. Not an easy decision, but it's about time the government paid us fairly. But equally, let's forget about money for a second. You know, we need more training places for nurses, um, and it's about time that we make the country aware how hard it is to work in what we're facing on a daily basis. Meanwhile, 10,000 ambulance workers with the GMB union are to stage further strike action in the coming weeks in their ongoing dispute over pay and staffing. Paramedics, emergency care assistants and call handlers will walk out on the 6th and 20th of both February and March. The union says following government inaction, they've been left with no choice. Unite also says it will announce further ambulance strike dates soon. Rishi Sunak insists the government is working to improve access to emergency care but Sir Keir Starmer says patients are left waiting for hours. Mr Speaker, it's three minutes past 12. If somebody phones, if somebody phones 999 now because they have chest pains and fear it might be a heart attack, when would the Prime Minister expect an ambulance to arrive? Yeah. Oh. Mr Speaker, it's absolutely right that people can rely on the emergency services when they need them. And that's why we are rapidly implementing measures to improve the delivery of ambulance times and indeed urgent and emergency care. But I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he cares about ensuring that patients get access to life-saving emergency care when they need it, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? The Education Secretary has met with union leaders in a bid to avert strikes by the National Education Union over seven days in February and March. Meanwhile, union leaders say no real progress on pay has been made and they're no nearer a solution. In other news, the rate at which prices are rising has slowed for the second month in a row, but the cost of some food has hit a 45-year high. The Office for National Statistics says the rate of inflation fell to 10.5% in December. That's down from 10.7% the month before. It says falling fuel costs were largely behind the slowdown, with the average petrol price down by 8.3 pence per litre since last month. The government has pledged to half inflation by the end of the year, but the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says there's still a long way to go. Any country anywhere in the world with inflation over 10% is seeing it at, at frankly dangerous levels for the stability of an economy. But for families up and down the country, they are seeing food price inflation of nearly 17%, and that's causing a massive hike in the cost of the weekly shop. And what that really shows is that for us and for other countries, the most important thing is to stick to a plan to bring down inflation. Former Cabinet Minister George Eustace has become the latest Conservative MP to announce he will not stand again at the next general election. Mr Eustace says it had been an honour to represent Camborne and Redruth in Cornwall since 2010. He also served as the Environment Secretary between 2020 and last year. The MP said at the next election he'd be 53 and is looking for another career outside of politics. 
At least 17 people, including four children, have been killed in a helicopter crash near Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Ukraine's interior minister and his first deputy were among those who died in the crash, which happened near a nursery in the town of Bavari. Officials say at least 25 people have been injured, including 11 children. The cause is unknown and there's been no comment from Russia. And all police forces in Britain are being asked to check their officers and staff against the National Police Database. It's after serving officer David Carrick was sacked from the force yesterday. The 48-year-old was fired from the Metropolitan Police after admitting to 49 criminal charges, including 24 counts of rape against 12 women over an 18-year period. The Home Office has asked for serving officers to be checked to identify anyone who might have slipped through the net before vetting standards were strengthened. You're up to date on GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. It's back to Mark. Bethany, thank you very much indeed. Now, GB News can reveal exclusively that at least 10,000 teenagers, some as young as 13 years old, are being exploited by criminal gangs to transport drugs. Most of the so-called county lines gangs are using Britain's rail network to carry huge quantities of illegal drugs and cash to communities across the country. Well, our Home and Security Editor Mark White was given exclusive access to follow a major British transport police operation going after these county lines gangs. <laughs> It's the height of the morning commute in central London. And here on the underground at Euston Station, the police are out in force. They're on the hunt for the county line's criminal gangs, using the transport network to ferry drugs, cash and weapons. Upstairs in the main station concourse, other officers have stopped and arrested this young man on suspicion of drug dealing. He was found with £1,400 in cash and a cheap burner disposable phone often used in drug deals. This countrywide operation is being led by British Transport Police and their dedicated County Lines unit. I have 70 staff that are dedicated to this type of work across the whole of the network. We vary our tactics, we vary our locations. You may not see them out there, but they're out there every day looking for criminals that are involved in County Lines activity. On board a train heading to the Midlands, this is rare access, following these plainclothes officers who are part of the County Lines Task Force as they look out for anything suspicious. If you've got valuables in there, the last thing you want is just stuff being stolen, yeah? A quick chat with this passenger and it's clear he's a legitimate traveller. But in the three years this task force has been operational, these officers and their colleagues have made more than 1,500 drug seizures, recovered one and a quarter million pounds in illicit cash, and taken more than 500 weapons off the rail network. On the day we were filming, here at Birmingham's New Street station, officers arrested a young man carrying this suitcase with 10 and a half kilos of cannabis inside. Further up the line in Wolverhampton, another man and a woman were stopped carrying a suitcase, this time with six kilos of cannabis inside. More than 40% of those arrested by the County Lines Task Force over recent years were teenagers. British Transport Police now works closely with social work and children's charities to identify those who might be victims themselves. If there is a young person or a vulnerable adult and there's a crime that's taking place but we recognise actually they're a victim of exploitation, then you've got an investigation process and a safeguarding process that can run parallel. Here at Coventry Station, another team of officers are working with police dog Ash and his keen sense of smell, a key weapon in identifying those worth a closer inspection. It doesn't take him long to pinpoint a likely suspect. As these plainclothes officers search the man, it's soon clear the police dog was bang on the money. We've got a uh, sealed bag, approximately £5,000 cash, um, 
So the man, gentleman has been arrested on suspicion of being concerned supply. So we've taken his custody and uh, processed. So we've seized the cash. Uh, we've got two of his phones, so they'll be seized as well. With at least 600 County Lines criminal gangs, it is a major ongoing issue for law enforcement right across the country, as our time with British Transport Police starkly illustrates. Tens of thousands of pounds worth of drugs and illicit cash seized in just a single day. Mark White, GB News, on the Rail Network. Let's get the latest now with Mark joining us in the studio. And, Mark, we, we can say that this was a targeted operation, but they didn't know what they'd be finding. I mean, extraordinary figures in terms of the what the drugs are worth and, and the cash being carried out in these sort of polythene bags. Because the, of the nature of this criminal enterprise, yeah. they know that every day there are many, many people that are going on to trains and the underground with money to go and buy drugs, uh, with the drugs in the first place. Uh, and so deploying in the way they did, mm. lots of officers at some key hubs, uh, they were pretty sure that they would get yeah, yeah. Uh, some likely suspects, and that's indeed what they got. As I say, that um, uh, one particular find at Birmingham New, New Street Station, 10 and a half kilos of cannabis, has a street value of over £100,000. <laughs> Six kilos of cannabis found at Wolverhampton, £60,000. And then there's all the money on top of that, yeah, yeah. Mark, uh, that these people were carrying. Who carries, really, mm. £5,000 around with them, vacuum-sealed in plastic? Yeah. Unless, according to the police, you're going off to purchase some drugs. And, and on reflex, of course, on this sort of... Uh underground black economy, what we're losing in tax. But the other aspect is, it's the exploitation of all these youngsters in the way that these networks are, are run. And you're saying some of them are as young as 13, and they're being sucked into this gang culture as a result of all this. Yeah, the criminal gangs, I mean, they're ruthless. They, they really don't care. Mm. Uh, and for them, it's, uh, it's a, there's a, a sort of a, a ready pool of young, impressionable people willing to get what is probably a modest amount of money, but mm -hmm. a lot for them, for doing what they would consider to be easy work, just getting a train ticket from the criminal gang to go up to Preston or whatever yeah. community it might be, hand over your drugs, take the money, then come back and give it to the gangs. The chances of being caught most days are probably pretty limited. Um, and you make some money out of that, so you can see why these youngsters are being attracted into that. But as you say, Mark, then they're sucked into the world of criminality. Yeah. And the drugs trade is a fuel, um, a fueler of all of the, 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 the sort of violent crime or a lot of the violent crime that we see around our towns and cities. Yeah, these youngsters nice. stabbed and, yeah. and even shot now, of course, firearms involved, the sort of escalation with, with the, the turf wars and so on. But how are they uh, assessing their... Uh, ability to, to target the Mr Biggs, the organised crime behind this? Because we've spoken before, especially with cannabis, about the involvement of, sort of Albanian gangs in this. Well, we know the Albanian gangs are increasingly dominant uh, on the drug scene in, in this country. They are in control, really, of the cocaine trade in the south <clears throat> of the country. Yeah. Uh, and then they're also asserting themselves ever more prominently in the cannabis trade, running a lot of the cannabis farms that used to be run by the Vietnamese. Now, mm. the Vietnamese are still running lots of uh, cannabis farms as well. And these operations that British Transport Police are mounting are very useful in trying to get the intelligence to put these people right. before the courts, because if they pick up a, a youngster who's got, say, a burner phone or sometimes two burner yeah, yeah. phones... Uh, there can be a lot of evidence on that, yes. who they're speaking to, who's giving them their instructions. Mm. They're probably on a bar burner phone as well, but they can get evidence yeah. that can really pinpoint where someone is. They raid home addresses. Um, sometimes one of the incidents, the, the chap who was stopped at Coventry Station with £5,000 on him, uh, they raided his house later and they found a big batch of steroids in there and the kind of scales that you use uh, for weighing... Uh, your, your drugs as well, so clearly uh, well, a good result for the for the police. Yeah, so not not just the sort of take in terms of the cash and the drugs, but the intelligence and, and what it can lead to in, in, in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's uh, th this is I think a very impressive unit that British Transport Police have because it's dedicated 
to this county lines uh, effort and 70 officers who go right around the country and they can muster enough staff to be able to mount these operations on a regular yeah. basis. With the plainclothes officers you saw on the train as well, they're a key part of what they do, you know, walking unsuspected, obviously, you know, if you're going, the, uh, um, if you're a passenger, you're not going to know no, no. That that's a police officer. And, it's, it's uh, and there we are thinking that it was just about fare evasion and yeah, picking indeed. up a ticket uh, fraud and so on. Anyway, Mark, thank you very much indeed for bringing us uh, that exclusive report. Uh, well, let's get the views now. Mark uh, Bracewell joining us, Managing Director of Blinded Faith, a charity helping children to escape from uh, a life of crime. Mark, thanks uh, for your time. And uh, as, as Mark White was indicating there, um, clearly it's easy money for them, but the problem is they get drawn into this culture then, don't they? Yeah, a lot of these youngsters who are getting involved in this, um, if we're being honest, are being exploited. Um, and there's a lot of youngsters that are getting involved um, within the county lines that um, are not doing it by their choice themselves. Um, and that's one of the things that we need to look at as well. Some of these children are getting forced to to carry drugs and carry money um, across the country. And, and, and what happens if, if they try to refuse or, or, or decline? What, what uh, consequences can there be for them? Um, well, we, we had a, a young gentleman that we were working with, for example, who was working for a county line gangs and they were paying him £5 a day to do so. Um, when he obviously woke up and seen the reality of it and wanted to get out, he ended up um, being hospitalised because they didn't want him to stop doing what they were doing. And, of course, as Mark White's indicated as well, once they get involved in the gangs themselves, there's all the associated problems with, with turf wars and we see all the stabbings and the shootings. Uh, it, it's a sort of spiral of decline, isn't it? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, especially for the youngsters that don't see a way out, um, obviously they become um, trapped and engulfed in, in, that, in, in, that, in that world and in, in that reality. Um, and especially the ones that feel that they haven't got anybody to, to speak to or... To, to help them get out of it, yeah. And, and what can you do to help? What what uh, sort of steps can you put in place? Well, I mean, I can only speak for ourselves, really, on, on obviously what we do. Um, so we have um, a 24-hour helpline um, where kids can phone that for free. Um, if they're in a situation that they believe that they, they can't get out of, they can phone us and we'll come out and either A, rescue them from where they are or obviously um, alert local authorities or the, the local um, social care. Um, if it's a child that's under 16, for example, um, we had one incident where a young person had been kidnapped by a county lines gang. Um, he managed to get hold of a phone. He phoned our um, free phone number and we was managed to pinpoint where he actually was um, and obviously alert the authorities and work with him and them to locate exactly where he was because he was in a city in a place where he'd never been before and didn't know where yeah. he was. And, and, and managed to, to get him to safety. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's, that's, that's great news. Well, uh, obviously, that's the message to, to release to these kids. Blinded faith, of course, uh, and, and you'd be glad to, to get any kind of calls from anyone that, that needs your assistance. Uh, thank you very yes, much we... indeed uh, for bringing us your point of view, Mark. Uh, uh, great to hear that you're able to help. Thank you very much indeed. Now, inflation taking a slight dip this morning, according to the latest figures from the Office for National Statistics, but the rate's still at a 40-year high. Energy and petrol costs bringing things down a little bit, but food still on the rise. Dairy, eggs uh, and uh, things like uh, pasta as well still on the way up, driving up the cost of shopping. Well, joining us now, our economics and business editor Liam Halligan once more with On The Money. So down, Liam, but not quite as much as we were thinking it could be, still not in single figures. The... the the cost of living crisis is easing, but not by very much at all. Mm. UK inflation is still in double digits, we learnt this morning. Let's have a look at the numbers. The Office for National Statistics said this morning that in December, the Consumer Price Index was 10.5% up on where it was in December 2021. That's down, but not much from the 107 figure in November and the 111 figure the month before in October. And that was the 41 year high, yeah. though, as you say, we're still very much in that vicinity. Breaking down that December number, Mark, food and non-alcoholic beverages were up 17%, 16.9%, roughly 17%. That's where the high cost of living is being felt when people go shopping for groceries for themselves and their family. Fuel prices also high 
11.5% up, though that rate of inflation for fuel has slightly eased as oil prices have come down below where they were before Russia invaded Ukraine. There are some aspects of the cost of living where inflation is still chunky but low relative to headline inflation, transport, that's fares, buses, trains, hire cars and so on, 6.9% inflation and recreation and culture, 4.8% inflation. You've got various attractions, uh, theme parks and so on, lowering prices or at least keeping their cost increases within the firm, not passing them on as yeah, yeah, much yeah. to try and get, frankly, people through the door, mm. given this cost of living squeeze. And, and the ONS saying it's largely this, this cheaper cost of fuel that's brought it down to 10.5%. But, you know, we, we're still talking, and we've, we've talked about the staples before. Milk on a yearly level, up 46.46%, uh, 46%, past to 29.1%. You know, feeding your family is still hugely expensive. And, of course, the problem is, for many people who are on strike, wanting these increases to keep pace with inflation, they're still feeling that their money is not going far enough. Households across the economy are suffering, even quite comfortably off households. Yeah, yeah. They're getting whacked with massive fuel bills. The sh price of the weekly shop is escalating. It's 100 quid to fill up the car, even if you don't yeah. drive for work, even if you sort of just drive for, you know, domestic purposes, if you like. And a lot of people are feeling this squeeze and it's not easing very much. I also wanted to highlight, Mark, if I may, cost pressures for firms, the producer yeah. price index. Yeah. I often highlight the producer price index. Raw, raw materials. All to of that, the, yeah. the, the cost of the yeah. stuff that yeah. firms need to provide us with goods and services. Now, as it happens, right, the series, the producer price in index series, it's actually been delayed. It's been suspended. We don't know when the figure's going to come out because there's nothing untoward. These things happen, but the ONS, there are some methodological things they're trying to iron out. But I would say producer price inflation is somewhere between 16, 17, 18 percent. That's certainly where it's been in recent months. It's still higher than the consumer price index, mm. which means there may be you know, more inflation down the because track. Because costs have to be passed that, on that, for them that, to make the money. To, to yeah, some yeah, degree. Yeah. Now, yeah. But what I want to highlight is this. OK, so the government has announced that the, there will be more support for households with their energy bills. Yeah. Firms will also get some support, though that support for firms is being drastically cut back and restricted now, soon, only to very, very high-intensity users like steelmakers and so right. on. So I had a chat earlier with a, a, a friend of GB News, somebody who I've interviewed many times over, well, since the channel started, a guy called Stephen Morley. Now, Stephen Morley is a very, very plugged-in guy. He is the president of the Confederation of British Metal Formers. These mm. are manufacturing companies that use steel and other metals. And make stuff. They don't yeah. make the steel. Those yeah. The steel makers are getting continued government support, yeah. but they're still very high intense energy use companies. And Stephen told me, with supply chain price pressure still very high, he is actually rather worried about firms folding and job losses in his sector. Here he is. I think we'll see companies failing. Uh, uh, quite high levels uh, so I think it's really important that they, they review it. Uh, at the moment I'm seeing absolutely no movement because they can't afford to do anything. Uh, we'll keep the pressure on as much as we can. We'll try and get more of our members into the high intensity scheme but, but it's be very difficult. Uh, even people who are qualifying, for instance like UK Steel, who qualify for the scheme are still uncompetitive to, to, to people like to countries like Germany. So it's, it's not it's not really helping anyone at the moment. It's, it will help certain companies, but it's only a small percentage of, of UK manufacturing. News in the <clears throat> wholesale gas prices, the international market are starting to come down. Well, wholesale gas prices are down extremely sharply, yeah. Mark. They were 350 euros on per European firm, yeah. markets per megawatt hour in August. Mm. They were 150 euros in December. They're now 55 euros. But this is the point. People like Stephen Morley are telling me from the industry front line mm. that bills aren't coming down. Right. They're not coming down nearly as quickly for uh, industrial users, and we certainly know they're not coming down. They're even going up for domestic users. So there's going to be a lot yeah. of political argy-bargy about this on-passing of lower wholesale 
oil and gas prices onto firms and households. Yeah. And there you got a guy from the industrial front line, Stephen Morley. We often focus on yeah, yeah. households, obviously, but saying that firms are suffering too. And unless there's more government support with their energy bills, there will be firm failures and job losses. People still hurting. Liam, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, you're with GB News Live and coming up, uh, recapping on PMQ's Prime Minister's questions, but uh, let's take a quick break for you now. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, you won't be surprised to learn that the NHS was the key battleground for Prime Minister's questions today. Labour leader Sakir Starmer calling on Rishi Sunak to admit that the health service was in crisis. But he uh, went on ambulance delays rather than the nurses' strike. The Prime Minister insisting it was not about politics, though, pointing to the fact that the NHS was dealing with unprecedented challenges. Well, we're joined now by our political reporter, Catherine Forster, who's uh, been following uh, the clashes in the Commons. It was interesting, Catherine, wasn't it, that it wasn't the nurses' strike that Keir Starmer went on, but um, a, a quite detailed uh, breakdown of ambulance waiting times going from, I think, Peterborough to Northampton to Plymouth. Yes, it was quite a striking approach, wasn't it, from Keir Starmer? He might have gone on the strikes. Of course, nurses are off today, but he didn't. He went on these horrendous ambulance waiting times, specifically asking the Prime Minister if somebody thought they were having a heart attack and called 999. He said, it's now 12.03. What time should it arrive? Well, it should arrive under government targets around 18 minutes later at 12.20. But we know from figures released last week and which Keir Starmer re Reiterated, the average time is one and a half hours for a Category 2 uh, call, which could be stroke or heart attack. Are these vary around the country. In some places, uh, the southwest, for example, it's an average of two and a half hours. So quite a clever way, I suppose, of demonstrating that the health service is, as he put it, um, said the government had brought the health service to a point of lethal chaos. And also, I suppose, a way of avoiding 
discussing the strikes because, of course, strikes are always tricky for Labour. We know, don't we, that a lot of their funding comes from the big unions. And Rishi Sunak pushed back and said, you know, if you're concerned about patient safety, why does Labour not support our minimum service level legislation to great cheers from the Tory benches? And then again later said, well, I know why. It's because Labour are in the pocket of their union paymasters. That also went down very well with the Conservatives. That's a line that we hear again and again and again. Um, Keir Starmer is now going to be travelling to the um, World Economic Forum in Davos along with his shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, is not going to that. Um, but the, the Labour top team have calculated it's a good opportunity for them to go abroad and show the world that they are. They would like to uh, think uh, the government in waiting and they yeah. are rather successfully wooing business at the moment. We know the Labour Party funding is going up and up. So a difficult time for the government and indeed for all of us as more and more strikes seem to be arranged by the day and no progress. Um, the Education Secretary met with teaching unions and apparently no progress there. So February the 1st looking like a very tough day in this country. Yeah, and of course the announcement then of more ambulance uh, stoppages from uh, the GMB Unite perhaps will indicate their dates as well. And did we get an indication about the government's continuing approach by uh, uh, Rishi Sunak pressing so much on this issue of uh, the minimum service levels that they want this legislation uh, really pushed through, um, perhaps taking on the unions in some way? Well, they are taking on the unions. They're very keen to stress that this is legislation that exists in much of the world. They say in Europe, countries like France, like Italy, like Spain already have it. In the US, um, blue light services, so ambulance, police, fire, fire brigade, cannot strike. It is illegal. They're saying we're not trying to make it illegal. We just want minimum safety levels. Of course, the NHS leaders are saying, well, we don't have that now. That's partly why we are striking. But this this legislation that the government have promised for a long time and now seem to be broadening is not going to get through the Commons and more significantly the Lords where it looks set to run into problems any time soon. The unions are also going to mount legal challenges and it is in some ways antagonising them at the moment, though obviously it's understandable why the government would want to bring this in. So. The result of that legislation, if and when it goes through, is some months down the line. So it doesn't solve any of the immediate problems yeah, yeah. that the government and indeed the country faces with all these mounting strikes now. Catherine, at Westminster, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll uh, let you go and speak to your friend behind you, uh, joining you once again there. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, he's gone now. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming up, can you have your cake and eat it? No, says Professor Susan Jeb, chair of the Food Standards Agency, saying, don't take cake into the office. Looks as if people are taking it seriously here. No cakes for see at the moment. Anyway, Bethany coming up with the news headlines. Mark, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 33 minutes past two. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. As nurses in England stage a two-day strike, the Labour leader is urging the Prime Minister to take responsibility and admit the NHS is in crisis. Members of the Royal College of Nursing from 55 NHS trusts are walking out in a long-running dispute over pay and patient safety. The action is expected to lead to thousands of operations and appointments being cancelled. Meanwhile, 10,000 ambulance workers with the GMB union are to stage further strike action in the coming weeks in their ongoing dispute over pay and staffing. Paramedics, emergency care assistants and call handlers will walk out on the 6th and 20th of both February and March. The union says, following government inaction, they've been left with no choice. Unite the union also says it will announce further ambulance strike dates soon. And the Education Secretary has met with union leaders in a bid to avert strikes by the National Education Union over seven days in February and March. Meanwhile, union leaders say no real progress on pay has been made and they are no nearer a solution. 
The rate at which prices are rising has slowed for the second month in a row, but the cost of some food has hit a 45-year high. The Office for National Statistics says the rate of inflation fell to 10.5% in December. That's down from 10.7% the month before. It says falling fuel costs were largely behind the slowdown, with the average petrol price down by 8.3 pence per litre since last month. And all police forces in Britain are being asked to check their officers and staff against the National Police Database. It's after serving officer David Carrick was sacked from the force yesterday. The 48-year-old was fired from the Metropolitan Police after admitting to 49 criminal charges, including 24 counts of rape against 12 women over an 18-year period. The Home Office has asked for serving officers to be checked to identify anyone who might have slipped through the net before vetting standards were strengthened. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Mark will be back in just a moment. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At six, it's Deems & Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At eight, join Mark Stein. And at nine, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, we were reflecting in Prime Minister's questions that the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, was talking about this legislation for minimum safety levels, where a nursing boss says that NHS patients do not get safe staffing levels any day of the week. As thousands of nurses in more than 55 NHS trusts in England stage their two-day strike in a dispute over pay and conditions. The RCN's chief, uh, RCN's chief executive, rather, Pat Cullen, making that uh, comment as patients face more disruption to operations and appointments, including potential cancellations, despite the promise that emergency care will be maintained. And next month, well, there could be double the number of nurses joining the picket lines when two further walkouts are planned. Meanwhile, the GMB union announcing today that thousands of ambulance workers are to stage fresh strikes in their dispute, again, over pay and staffing. Well, to monitor what's happening across the country, we can now go to uh, St George's Hospital in Stafford, where our West Midlands reporter, Jack Carson, uh, has been uh, getting the views of the striking nurses. And South East England reporter Ray Addison on the picket line at the Royal Sussex County Hospital in Brighton. Uh, but first uh, to you, Jack, uh, with an indication there in the Midlands that uh, they're, uh, they're holding firm across the country, it seems. 
100 percent there's been a lot of cars um right on queue there's been a lot of cars beeping showing their support as they've been driving by uh, the picket line today and the nurses singing nurses chanting showing they're united to uh, to strike and continue to continue striking for better pay and for better working conditions of course one of the things um that's been frequently mentioned is the staffing levels on wards and that the nurses feel they can't give the care that patients deserve because um, they're having to do so many other extra jobs and they say that the pay element comes into it um, because that's going to help uh, incentivize people that are newly trained nurses to come into the NHS rather than agencies and other things where they know they can get more money as it currently stands but to find out uh, what nurses have been thinking I've been speaking to a few on the picket line this morning and this is what they had to take about much more than pay. It's about the fact that because the pay is so awful, we can't get the nurses, so it makes the wards unsafe, it makes the care unsafe, it makes patients unsafe. Uh, it wasn't an easy decision. Um, you know, we're all in nursing for a reason. We want to be caring for our patients, um, but we're all aware there is a cost of living crisis and nurses' wages just haven't been going up. Um, it's not just for nurses. I'm actually a nurse associate. It's doing it for us as well. It's our health cares that work endlessly hard, etc. Um, yeah, not an easy decision, but it's about time the government paid us fairly. But equally, let's forget about money for a second. You know, we need more training places for nurses. Um, and it's about time that we make the country aware how hard it is to work in what we're facing on a daily basis. We know on the issue of pay, of course, that uh, the RCNR are suggesting that they're, ne they're negotiating around 5% above inflation. But Steve Barclay, the health secretary, uh, saying that that is just an unaffordable pay rise, which is going to stoke inflation and take billions away, he says, from where it's really needed. But Pat Cullen, the RCN general secretary, saying that nurses aren't striking, that people aren't dying because nurses are striking. Nurses are striking because people are dying. But on the, for patients, what the impact this has been is that we know from the December strikes around 30,000 appointments had to be uh, rescheduled. Similar numbers uh, will be seen from these set of strikes as they also walk out again tomorrow. But from the NHS's point of view, uh, for patients that need care, ring 111 in the first instance. But if you feel it is life threatening, still call 999. Thank you very much, Jack, for updating us uh, there in Stafford. So let's head down to the south coast now. And Ray is uh, on the picket line there at the Royal Sussex County Hospital uh, in Kemptown in Brighton. And uh, Ray, this is a theme that's running through. It's not just about pay, they say. It's about concerns for patient safety uh, and, of course, conditions in the hospital wards. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the, the message that we're, I'm hearing today from nurses is that uh, this strike is very much about patient safety. Yes, uh, they need uh, to have improved wages, they tell me, but only because that will maintain staffing levels here, and those staffing levels are key uh, for maintaining patient safety. I'm joined now by Davina Lovell. She's a deputy sister uh, at the Children's A&E Department. Davina, thank you very much uh, for being with me this afternoon. Um, obviously, you're a, a nurse in A&E. How challenging has it uh, become working in that department? Um, it's often described as a war zone these days, which is not a word that should be used with a children's A&E. We're not able to offer the standards that we strive to do. Patient safety is most certainly being affected. We will work as hard as we possibly can, but there just aren't enough of us anymore. Too many staff are leaving because of the pressure, the lack of staff available, the pay certainly is affecting things. We need to make a change now because we're running out of time. This is the first time uh, you're striking here today. It's the first time nurses in Sussex have, have gone on strike. How difficult a decision was it for you? Awful, awful. Um, I think everybody over the last few days has really struggled with this. We're doing this because we need the patients to be safe. We're trying to be an advocate and a voice for nursing, for patient safety and to make a change before it's too late. You're worried about patient safety uh, moving forward. What about patient safety today? If somebody has an accident, they need to bring a loved one into accident emergency today, especially a child. Uh, what level of care will they receive? Will it be enough? Yes. 
It definitely will. And it's very important that anybody at home with a very sick or injured child does attend A&E. The doctors, there are nurses who are still working. We will not let them come to harm, but there is a lot of us out on strike. People are safe in there. Davina, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as you can hear, a lot of passion here. Uh, the numbers, I'd have to say, have dropped from their peak of about 300 about an hour ago. We're probably back to about um, 100 nurses. Uh, second day of strikes will be taking place tomorrow, and I'm told that will be much uh, larger attendance on that date. Yes, uh, indication of their determination and, of course, the public support, those horns going off. Uh, Ray down there in Kemp Town in Brighton and, of course, Jack in Stafford, thank you very much indeed for updating us from the picket lines. Well, let's speak now to NHS paediatric nurse Olivia Princewell, who voted to strike, but her trust didn't reach the majority required to take action. Olivia, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to, to speak to us. Uh, what were the reservations, do you think, that other uh, staff members had in your trust? Um, I'm certain most of us are not happy with it, but I definitely know everyone shares um, the same view. We're all happy nurses are finally striking because we do deserve a pay rise. And I, I feel like people don't understand it's not just about the money aspect, but like, you know, other colleagues have said, it's about patient safety and about the fact we're responsible for a lot of people out there, a lot of lives, and people don't understand it's, it's a very stressful environment to be in. So as much as we didn't get to strike today, we're all... We're all happy that everyone out there is going and is striking to get their pay. Yeah, and, and uh, in, in terms of the pay deals, I mean, obviously people are uh, struggling, as they say, but it's the fact that there are 47,000 vacancies uh, across uh, nursing departments and I guess uh, a better pay deal would attract those workers in. Absolutely. It, it will certainly attract more people in. I feel like a lot of people don't understand that um, the fact we're having to work in such critical environment is taking away the joy of nursing. It's taking away the joy of actually being around, you know, everyone, caring for our patient and having more, you know, pay and, and adequate pay because I feel like everyone in the country is going through a lot financially yeah, yeah. and having that means that we although we know we're risking a lot by working in such critical condition at least we can't complain we have every reason to complain right now we're working in a place that is really understaffed we have a number of patients that to be honest the ratio between um, nurses and patients is absolutely not safe nowadays and most especially we're getting less pay for other people out there in the country that are not responsible for people's lives and are still getting better paid than us. So I don't really understand. We have so many vacancies because newly qualified nurses don't want to stay. It's a very critical environment. We're stressed, um, emotionally drained. So having a better pay would definitely go a long way in, in helping problem, in solving, or at least it will be a stepping stone to a better NHS. Can I ask you, Olivia, have you considered yourself, your, your position in the profession and, and thought about giving it in? Oh, absolutely. I remember, and I always share this view, um, I remember when I was training um, to become a nurse, it was the most, and it was um, during the COVID period, it was the most stressful period of my life. And being in, in the hospital setting, and I was in an intensive care setting, it absolutely traumatised me. And I really thought, oh my God, this is what I've always wanted. But everyone is complaining around me. No one is getting fair pay. The staff to um, patient ratio is absolutely applauding. Why should I even be a nurse at this point? And it really, really put me in a critical um, position where I felt like I had to leave. Um, I couldn't stay in the hospital. I couldn't stay in, in, in an A&E setting, for example, or like an intensive care children's setting, although it was something I would have really loved to experience. So I don't blame other newly qualified nurses or other nurses that are training to know what actually want to come into the hospital, into the NHS. And this just goes on and on in like a very... Um, harmful circle in which the NHS has found itself between people that want to leave and people that don't want to join. And unfortunately, like we said, the pay doesn't really help. Um, nowadays, the whole country is in a critical crisis financially. And really, we're, we're barely meeting like the end, at the end of the month, we're struggling to pay our bills, our rent. But, you know, if that was improved, it could really, really help. It could really, really go a long way. And I don't blame, you know, the other nurses for giving up because really it does take a toll on you. Yeah, I, I can well imagine it. Well, Olivia, thank you very much indeed for sharing your story and uh, your views uh, and joining us here uh, on uh, GB News. Thanks very much indeed for your time.
And, of course, we'll reflect uh, on this continuing action with uh, more uh, planned tomorrow, as uh, Ray was saying. Now, it's fast approaching that time of day when many of us might uh, put the kettle on, pass around perhaps the biscuits or even share homemade Victoria sponge. How about a Dundee fruitcake? Well, don't, says the head of a food watchdog, suggesting workers should rethink bringing cake and sugary treats into the workplace in case they should tempt colleagues who shouldn't eat them. Professor Susan Jebb, who's chair of the Food Standards Agency, saying it uh, could even be regarded as uh, akin to passive smoking, saying, with smoking, we have got to a place where we understand that individuals have to make some effort, but that we can make their efforts more successful by having a supportive environment. Well, let's speak to someone who knows her brownies from a Bakewell tart if you pardon the expression. Holly Bell, former Great British Bake Off finalist, joining us. Holly, thank you very much indeed uh, for Hello. joining us. Um, Demonising cake, what a thing for a Bake Off finalist. Uh, yes, well, um, I know what she means. I do understand because um, I look back to when I first worked in an office in the uh, early noughties and... Uh, people were still smoking in the office. So for yeah. smokers, that was obviously a complete nightmare um, because they couldn't, they're never going to have any chance of stopping. But when it comes to cake, my point of view is there's cake and there's cake. So if your co workers are bringing in very cheap cakes that are from places like big supermarkets where there's lots mm. of palm oils and um, uh, basically they're not very good for you. Yeah, I would say that's not great. If they're made, homemade, made with regular ingredients that your grandmother would, you know, recognise, I think that's okay. You know, um, a little of what you fancy does you good. And also um, there's a bonding that goes on when you share, You essentially you break bread or you, you break cake. Or break um, cake, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so maybe no to the, the, the salt and the sugar and the hydrogenated fats and so on, but yes to the natural ingredients. And, and I guess we'll be talking about things like fruit cake. Will there be lots of nuts and cherries and sultanas and things like that? Well, the nuts issue is always difficult, isn't it? Because there's a lot of people with allergies. So, yeah, for good instance, point, in school now, no nuts allowed. Um, I actually think even a brownie that's got a really good quality dark chocolate in it, that's got loads of good stuff in it for you um butter rather than oil you know butter is um actually you know everybody sort of went away from it for a long time and now people are starting to realize it's a lot better for you than most oils um yeah. bit of sugar you know it's credit and debit isn't it if you have a piece of cake with your um 11 o'clock cup of tea then you can't have any pudding that evening so i think we've all just got to be able to take responsibility for our own choices, haven't we? Yeah, and, and as you say, the skills of actually maybe baking yourself and, and making something homemade makes a difference. So let's put you on the spot. When it's fast approaching three o'clock, what's your favourite for uh, afternoon tea? Well, uh, I would say brownies because I have my own company <laughs> making brownies. Yeah. Um, but um, I do love a brownie and I really like fruitcake. Like adore yeah. it. So fruitcake with loads of cherries in. And and just to uh, reflect on your time uh, at Bake Off, what is actually the most difficult to make? What should you perhaps avoid if you are uh, getting into the kitchen and, and thinking of getting something on the uh, into the oven? Oh gosh, um, I'm just trying to remember. It's the I've, you know I've got a little. Bit I, I know PTSD anything involving but, meringues um, is a bit tricky, isn't probably it? Probably say avoid things like croc on bouches where you're making shoe pastry and then spun sugar and trying to construct it. Um, yeah, I would steer clear of that, go for a nice cake, a brownie, a flapjack, something like that. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us and championing the cause of the Great British Cake. Holly Bell, former Great British Bake Off finest. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, don't forget, of course, uh, to get in touch with us and uh, bring us your views on whether uh, cake should still be on the menu for the office or uh, your workplace. Uh, and um, the indication from Professor Susan Jebb uh, is uh, the Food Standards Agency saying, don't. 
what fun. Anyway, let's uh, bring you some pictures we're getting in uh, on the latest from Extinction Rebellion. Uh, you remember, of course, that they were involved in many protests. Well, they've been chaining themselves to the uh, entrance of the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities in London, uh, protesting against a new coal mine in Cumbria approved by uh, the Secretary Michael Gove. Well, police tried to block access to the doors there, but protesters lit smoke bombs and then poured water-soluble paint designed to resemble oil across the floor, uh, while others, we're told, danced around dressed in canary costumes outside the building at Marsham Street in Westminster. Uh, indications that uh, though the soluble paint was washed away. So uh, clearly they were taking the uh, environmental cause into consideration by uh, not putting oil-based paints, cut the ties to fossil fuels, uh, that particular... Um, placard there. Uh, there has been a bit of a two-week lull in the various protests, but they say they will continue to bring their message uh, and demonstrate peacefully, they say. Now, uh, we were talking about the cake. Let's see what else uh, you've been bringing us in your views in our inbox. Uh, Mark from Wales has been in touch to say, November 2022, my wife was struggling to breathe. I could not wait for an ambulance, so I drove her at 2am to A&E. Then we had to wait with a full waiting room until 1pm until she was seen by a doctor. Starmer, when challenged by the PM about uh, Labour-run Welsh NHS, mumbled about political games. We are pensioners and have health issues. I fear we'll die because we're not going to get treatment in an emergency. It's a frightening reality of Labour-run NHS. Uh, Bruce, meanwhile, I consider the nurses and ambulance workers' strikes to be a shameful travesty and wrong. Many innocent people having to put their lives at risk and likely dying. We'll keep your views coming and we'll reflect those. Uh, coming up next, uh, we've got uh, Nana joining us for Patrick. And uh, we're back tomorrow. See you then. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin and this is your latest weather forecast from the Met Office. The next 24 hours keep the cold and frosty conditions for most of us. Many of us will stay dry, but where we do have showers, they're going to be a mixture of rain, sleet and some snow, along with some hail, and it could turn things icy. So we have Met Office yellow warnings in place across western areas and across northern Scotland, where the snow showers really do keep on coming. But a further covering possible for Northern Ireland, northwest England, parts of Wales, and it may well turn icy overnight in the far southwest. Many southern, eastern and central parts will just stay dry, clear and cold. Minus two, minus three, that's in towns and cities. Rural areas will be much lower than that. A bit more wet weather to come into northern Scotland through tomorrow. Chiefly that'll be rain, certainly on coast, but above any hills, uh, it'll be mostly snow that continues to fall. A few flurries possible in northwest England, north Wales and parts of Northern Ireland through the day. Again, a mixture of rain, sleet and some snow here, but many central and eastern parts, again, just dry and sunny but cold, with highs of only three or four Celsius for many and feeling colder in that strong wind across northern Scotland that will continue to bring snow showers over the hills here during Thursday night and then potentially things turning icy once more. And it could